میں آپ سب کو خوش آمدید کہتا ہوں جس ہم پاکستانی ہیں سو مجھے خوشی ہو رہی ہے کہ میں پچھلے دنوں ہی لمس میں ایک ٹاک دے کر آیا ہوں اینڈ وہاں پہ بہت کم لوگ تھے اٹ واز آن ڈارک میرٹ لیکن دے ور برائٹ اسٹوڈنٹس دے آر اینڈ فیکلٹی ممبرس آف کورس لیکن یہ کہ بہت شکریہ تھینک یو سو یہاں پہ جو آڈینس ہے میں ہم ریلی آنرڈ کہ آپ سب لوگوں نے وقت نکالا اور جہاں تک ایکسپرٹ کی بات ہے ڈارک میٹر اسپیشلی ایسی چیز ہے کہ اس میں کوئی ایکسپرٹ ہو نہیں سکتا بیکاز یو نیور سین اٹ یو نیور ٹچ اٹ یو نیور اسمیل اٹ سو آف کورس دیر آر کوجن تھیوریز کنجیکچرس جو بنے ہوئے ہیں دیر آر بین آبزرویشنس بائی اے گریٹ لیڈی اسٹرانمر ایسٹرو فزسٹ پروفیسر ویرا روبن مے شی ریسٹ ان پیس شی پیسٹ اے ٹو ایئرز اگو اینڈ آئی ایکچولی ڈیڈیکیٹ دس ٹاک ان آر میموری so she was the one of the first people who pointed out that there are things uh, out there which we cannot see and they are in fact the predominantly thank you sir i'm so honored there are a couple of people so th what they saw was ke once they looked at the galaxy rotation curve and i'm going to show all that to you what they saw was ke majority actually two third of the universe or three-fourths, some, somewhere between those two numbers, is all that invisible energy, invisible mass that we have never seen. So, as much as particle physics mein hua tha, and I'm going to take you on a, a brief journey in time, uh, how we all started this, how we got here, so, and what we are going to, what we expect actually, frankly speaking, if you are a physicist here, then nobody would be very happy to come to this talk because the other log they're pretty disappointed because it's nice all okay and still we haven't been able to detect it there are half a dozen collaborations including two that i'm a member of we have been frantically looking for dark matter and there is just no clue there are alternative theories but they are not so cogent not so convincing like the theories that we are working upon so we are still uh, we are still confident that somehow somewhere ahead in time we might come across stumble upon just like gravitational waves. It was totally a very ambitious project. I remember back there when I was in Houston doing my PhD. At that time, I was really very much interested to join LIGO, uh, or LIGO, whatever, uh, the way you pronounce it. And then there was no hope, and all of us are in 2016, or 15, it was 15. We saw that merger of black holes, and then gravitational waves were no more uh, a mystery. Um, to be exact, actually, there was a Nobel Prize awarded for their detection, but that was indirect. So I met uh, Nargis Maniwala. She's a professor at MIT, again, a Pakistani origin lady. So I met her at the International Congress for High Energy Physics in Chicago in 2016. And I talked to her and I said, well, a lot of things that you're saying are, are really hand-waving. Because as far as detection is concerned, that's true. But all this stuff that you're showing, these black hole merger and how they were, that is all a bit speculative. So. Science is different from beliefs because science is tested on, on the basis of observations, experiments, and that also with very much higher precision. For instance, in dark matter, we need to have a signal-to-noise ratio of about five, which is really a great challenge, unlike other things that you could just detect with a signal-to-noise ratio of three. So are there any engineers, physicists here? Okay, great, wonderful. So I've tried to make a talk which is a public talk and sort of a bit technical. If I get too technical, please stop me and I'll try to come back. So let's start uh, this, um, these slides. So there's sort of a crash course, uh, which on behalf of Mr. Arib Azar, Azar Saab I'm doing in astrophysics and cosmology. So trying to educate you what astrophysics cosmology is, those of you who are not familiar with the subject, and trying to educate myself because I or nobody's uh, expert in anything at all. We may have been trained in certain things, but nobody, to be honest, is expert because 10 years down the road, just like Feynman said that I've got a Nobel Prize for something I discovered in the past, and somebody might come after 10 years, one of you perhaps, a new kid on the block, and say, well, everything goes down the drain because I've detected something new. And then there goes your standard model, I'm sorry. Your standard model, the model of cosmology, everything goes down the drain. So we all are, frankly speaking, students, and that's what we are trying to do. So it's just a debate, a discussion. I'll go through a couple of concepts. Um, there's, I apologize once again for uh, the delay in starting it. So there's a lot of stuff that I put down there. And the purpose of this slideshow is it's totally 
free for anybody to copy. You can email me. I'll be happy to share it with just 30 megabytes or something. So I need to put it on, on somewhere where you could access it. So please take it home, go through it, and then we can have a discussion later on. I'll just go through the major stuff, and then we'll have questions and answers uh, in which you could ask me things. But roughly, we'll start with this uh, introduction to a few things, and then we'll go to the end. A disclaimer. Most of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today, and like my scientific talks, is totally speculative. It's based on conjectures. Some good theories, like string theory, of course, not verified. So it's, again, a theory. But I'm going to talk about like particle physics, the cosmological model. That is what you can say it is scientific. Because it has been tested, it has been observed. Regarding dark matter theories, string theories, black holes, a lot of that stuff, Rosen bridges, that is all beautiful theoretical work which our theoretical uh, theorist colleagues have been doing. So I'm being an experimentalist. I totally would stick to the facts which can be measured or have been measured. So just like uh, Azhar Saab, beautifully I had a discussion with him and the write-up that he made, I think I need to take him with me and get him into a cosmology course and get him a, uh, a new cosmologist perhaps. So whenever you stare you know, just the sky out, outside the window. If on a clear day you would see a lot of stuff on sky and you would wonder that what all that stuff is. And you see, mainly what you see is just a couple of lights. And an ignorant guy like me, because I'm not an astronomer, they are wonderful people. I've not been trained as an astronomer. So an ignorant guy could, like me could just think that these are just stars. But actually there are constellations, galaxies, planets. So many different things are out there. So it all started perhaps 2,500 years ago or uh, maybe um, more older than that with Democritus coming up with the theory of an atom. And then you have this great era of, which is called the scholastic period, the scholastic era when you had people, great people like uh, Plato in the center. This is a painting by Raphael, the school of Athens. So you have Plato on the left, and you can't see his hand clearly. He points toward the sky. And then you have Aristoteles with him on his left, which points towards the ground. Aristoteles was known as, um, he is known as the father of natural philosophy, physics. He's the first person who wrote the first book on physics. And Plato himself was a great philosopher. But, and you can say these are the pioneers of natural philosophy. And Plato also had a theory on light, which I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about light and its theories, but not really the theory that Plato uh, talked about, which was the metaphysics theory of light. Science may not accept it, but what he termed as was that light was the basis of the universe. Because at that time, 2,500 years ago, they did not have experiments, observations like we have. So in a way, the statement is a good statement because base of everything turns out to be a vibration, because that's what light is. It's a photon the particle of light, which is basically a quantum of energy which is vibrating in space-time. So this was the start when the thought of science and all these things began. And unfortunately, it took like, once the Greek era was over, and then you had the time when the Romans took over, you had the Alexandria Library, Cleopatra, and then the library was burned. So for a long time, there was sort of a vacuum which was created, and then Alhazen came. Ibn al Hasim, Ali Ibn al Hasim, and he's known as the first scientist by some quarters, and he was a person, father of optics, father of a number of things in science. So that was uh, the renaissance of Islamic science or Eastern science, you can say, while the Europe was in dark ages after having been through a wonderful time in Greece. So this was the time then when physics started to get molded, and astronomy saw also arise, especially in East, with Nasiruddin Tosi and Al-Kindi, who, funded by nobody else but Halaku Khan, built the first observatory in Iran. That was the first observatory in Marage, which is in the Azerbaijan region of Iran, the Azerbaijan province of Iran. As you know, the north of Iran um, sort of coincides with Azerbaijan. So this observatory was built there under the, under the rule of Halaku Khan, and the, uh, the director of that was Nasiruddin Tosi. And there, uh, these efforts for, uh, took place to understand the celestial objects, which is the science of astronomy. So unfortunately, that was the end of that era, because then, you know, as the Eastern Europe, 
a number of uh, European regions and the East got doomed because of the Halakhu Khan and a lot of political reasons. And then after a couple of, uh, I would say about four centuries, then you have this Renaissance in Europe and you have people like uh, Uller, the Swiss mathematician, and people like Copernicus, the Polish, if I'm not wrong, uh, astronomer. And they came up with a new body of science in mathematics, in geometry, in physics, and in astronomy as well. And in fact, Euler's insights like this Euler identity that is written in front of you, which has the five basic elements in mathematics, or you can say in nature, zero, one, pi, iota, the imaginary number, and the exponent e, the natural log constant. So you have all these in the form of this identity, which is known as the Euler's identity. And then you can expand it, just as you can expand any, any relation, especially with imaginary numbers. In a series of sines and cosines, I'm, I have to resort a little bit to some technical stuff, but we all have studied this in our high school. So this series, then you know this is a harmonic series of sines and cosines, and then it turns out that you can break every function like that expresses in terms of this series, and that was the start of this formalism that is used in engineering and in science. So, and this simple identity actually, you can take it up to very advanced levels to about many, many dimensional objects like quaternions and then uh, Lie group algebra. So, this was a time when Sir Isaac Newton, this great man of uh, 17th century, came up and he's uh, he was not just a physicist, but he was a mathematician as well, an astronomer as well, and he was the father of calculus, so his insights, the calculus that he invented, integration, differentiation, all that became the science, the methods that you need to have in order to calculate things in science and engineering, and you, as you know, science or engineering is completely incomplete without calculus. So that was the era, and this was followed by the first revolution when this uh, British gentleman, James Clark Maxwell, the British scientist, he came up with the first wonderful theory of ele electromagnetism in which he unified electricity with magnetism, which were the concepts well known for many centuries. And there's a, this is sort of a joke in physics community and God said Maxwell equations and then there was light. So these equations have been tried, tested, and they became the base of classical electromagnetism and classical physics. So that gives the concept of light, which is actually a combination of electric fields, electricity, electrical energy, you can say, and the magnetic energy, and they are self-regenerating each other and going in the transverse direction. So they are the transverse waves. So this is the wave character of light, the classical wave character of light. And then you have a whole spectrum of this radiation, and then light was known as electromagnetic radiation because light is just a specific example of electromagnetic radiation. So this is electromagnetic radiation which starts with radio waves like AM radio, FM radio, and then all the way you keep increasing the frequency, and so the frequency goes up, and since the energy of electromagnetic radiation is proportional to frequency, so the energy goes up and the wavelength goes down because they are inversely related to each other. So then you have radio waves and then microwaves, which you use in ovens, in your cell phones, in radar, drones, everything, you have microwaves, and then the microwave region, which is like gigahertz, megahertz, start with that. So gigahertz is the region for these microwaves starting from maybe 500 megahertz or something. And then you have the microwave region going all the way up to the terahertz waves, and then you have the infrared waves with which you control remotes and things like that, the heat itself. And then you have the small region which we can see with our naked eyes, which is the visible light. And then you have this spectrum of light, and then it is followed by more energetic rays like ultraviolets and then X-rays, which are the ionizing radiations which can harm people. And then you can go up to gamma rays, extremely uh, energetic radiations. This is the spectrum of electromagnetic light. All this is necessary to understand, excuse me, to understand because what I'm going to talk about in our cosmological model, that knowledge is actually built upon these basic concepts. So then, this was perhaps the second revolution, as I, I, I would say in my humble opinion, where you have the modern physics being developed by these great minds at the Solvay conferences, uh, which took place, which were the invitation-only conferences in Brussels. And you can see these great people like uh, Max Planck, um, Curie, perhaps there should be Einstein. Yes, Einstein is there. You can see him in the left. And a great person, Rutherford, who founded the nuclear physics, and a couple of all these people, 
I forgot to mention one of the great personalities on his, whose work Einstein built was the Dutch physicist Lorentz. So Lorentz, some of the work that Lorentz did was used by Einstein in his theory of relativity. So by the time 1927 came and the fifth Solvay conference happened, you had a lot of people who, were, who had already contributed the development of modern physics. So the physics before this was just the classical physics and the modern physics started with that era. So you have all these people and I'll specifically go through a few of them. I, I, I was actually successful to get a color picture for, especially for you. And here you can see these two people, Max Planck and Marie Curie. Apart from being wonderful people, wonderful scientists, they also face a lot of tragedy in life. Max Planck's son was executed by Nazis, although he was trying to help the Jewish scientists flee Germany so that they could save their lives. He had lost three children during childbirth. His wife he lost, and he saw everything he observed pretty peacefully and stoically. And if you look at his life's last video in which he talks about, you see that what a great, wonderful person he was. And then so he, and Marie Curie herself was a, po a Czech or Polish, I'm sorry. Anyway, an immigrant, a Czech immigrant who came to France to study along with her husband, Pierre. And they went through a lot of struggle to study as an immigrant in France. And then ultimately they discovered, like my father ta taught me, how they went through the struggle to discover radium and radioactivity. And then she got the Nobel Prize. And soon after she got the Nobel Prize, Pierre died in a tragic automobile accident. And then she had that struggle alone with her children. French Academy of Science never let her be a member of Academy because she was a woman. And there was all this discrimination going on. And then she went ahead to get the second Nobel in, in science, in chemistry. And she's so far the only person which neither a man or woman could be able to do that feat to have Nobel prizes in two different disciplines of science. So she is that twice Nobel laureate in physics and chemistry. So, and then she went through and she used to carry this ambulance and mobile ambulance in city trying to get x-rays of people. And she did not know that the baby sh that she discovered, radium, was taking a toll on her life and finally, she succumbed to uh, blood cancer because of this great exposure to radium and radioactivity. And actually, uh, recently I saw an image of an, one of the notebooks of Marie Curie. It is still so much dangerous that you could die because of the radiation dose which is there in that notebook. So these were the perils with which they discovered science and they molded science. So Max Planck, uh, so Curie discovered uh, radium. Max Planck came up with one of these two extremely important formulas in science, which is E equals to H nu. Energy is equal to an amount, a magnitude of frequency. And there you have the Planck's constant. And then she discovered, and he was the first per person to actually, that's how the quantum physics began, when he could explain the, a curve of, radio, uh, of a black body radiation, how it should be, which was not explained before using classical physics. And then she discovered polonium and radioactivity, so all this. While this was going on, they were, and finally, this is what be, became the base of radiation, the quantum base of radiation. So, then there were two schools of thought competing with each other, with two, uh, as, I mean, equally great uh, achievements, equally great, uh, equally important work that they did. So there was Einstein, he came up in 1905 with a special theory of relativity telling us that once you move in a frame which is very fast, like the speed of light, your, the time would become slow, the length would contract. So these kind of crazy effects which nobody could ever even think of before relativity. And then 10 years later, so that was the start of time dilation, length contraction. And then finally, in just 10 years later, he came up with, the, with this beautiful theory of gravitation, the general theory of relativity. So this theory then became the basis of all these gravitational waves, black holes, and all these things. So this was the relativist, relativity uh, school of thought, which Einstein was there working, building upon works by Lorenz and Fitzgerald and Riemann, his geometry. And the other <coughs> school of thought was this, the quantum physics school of thought, where people like Schrodinger on left, and then uh, Niels Bohr, whom we all studied in uh, high school uh, at the bottom right, and his student, that naughty looking guy on the left standing, Heisenberg, and then you have uh, Max Born and Dirac. So these all, all these people, Schrodinger came up with his equation, Dirac came up with his equation to express how electrons and photons interact, the theory of electron which is known as. And then uh, you have Heisenberg who 
explained the uncertainty principle that you cannot measure with certainty either a position or momentum at the same time or energy or time at the same time. And then you have uh, Heisenberg who came up with this principle and also he brought a new picture of Schrodinger's equation which is known as the Heisenberg's representation. And then the problem also was that like they say Schrodinger brought his cat which is a famous paradox uh, Schrodinger's cat that according to quantum mechanics let me uh, which is the most craziest uh, theory of all times. Even Einstein did not believe in it. He said God doesn't play dice, his famous historic words. So uh, theory, of, uh, theory of quantum mechanics, unlike uh, the classical physics or classical science, does not talk about things in term, with a determinism. It's a probabilistic theory. You can tie it with your spiritual belief, if you will, with the concept of fate or destiny. So this is, everything is, has a measure of possibility and impossibility. So once you go down to the level of microcosm, which is like about 10 to minus 6 meters, the diameter of here, 1 micron. Once you go down one, uh, to distances like 1 micrometer, 1 nanometer, like the size of DNA, and then 1 picometer, which is close to the size of X-ray, and then to 1 femtometer, which is the size of a proton, hydrogen atom. Femtometer of Fermi. So once you go down one micrometer, that is a different world you enter into. That's no more, where no more these laws of classical physics, mechanics work. No more you have the Newton's law of gravity. No more you have electromagnetism like you had in Maxwell theories. So this is called the quantum world, the quantum microcosm. So first law of quantum mechanics says that nothing is deterministic. If an electron has a probability of being here, he would be here. If it has a probability to go through this wall, it would go through and that is a quantum mechanical effect which is called quantum mechanical tunneling, resonant tunneling or non-resonant tunneling through which an electron or any particle can go through. Then you have the many, you know, the superposition principle. You have every particle has a kind of a function associated with it which we call the wave function. And this wave function is, there is a superposition of these wave functions and that means that all kinds of possibilities are possible. Electron may be here can be there, it's here, it's everywhere. So this sort of a no, non-locality. So Einstein worked with Podolsky and Rosen and they even came up with a EPR uh, theory, EPR paradox, in which Einstein said that it's impossible that how a particle could be like non-local and it could know about, like if there are two particles that are entangled, generated by the same laser at the same time, how could they follow the same path? They do not know about each other, unless there are secret link, there's a mobile phone they have. So this he called as a variable, hidden variable theory. So Einstein said that there's a hidden variable, somehow we don't know about some physics that these particles or these microscopic particles have. And then anyway, there was another bright guy called Bell. So Bell brought a new theory and he proved that it's impossible to predict the results of quantum mechanics using any hidden variable theory. So these were the two, uh, so the, this conjecture, this, uh, this effect was there where, where you have the Schrodinger cat that this cat is in a closed box and you can have, uh, okay, that slide just went by. So there's some mechanism by which you kill the cat using radioactive poison. Now, since till the box is closed, you don't know whether she's alive or she's dead, whether she got that shot or not. But once you open the box, you would know for sure. So that's what quantum mechanics says that you, any, any system, quantum mechanical system or particle would not you won't be able to know its state unless you look at it. So, so the reality is not subjective, but objective. So this was another weird thing that nobody could really reason with that. How could it be? I'm standing here. We all are here in this room. Either we are here or we are not here. So where it happens that you could not measure the momentum or properties of particles uh, with uh, a, a precision. That is one thing. And also you could never know them unless you actually measure. And that is called the collapse of a wave function. So there's an infinite possibility of every possible reality and once you look at it, it would just collapse into one particular reality. So that is known as collapse of a wave function. So these were kind of weird uh, ideas with which uh, quantum mechanics was started and there was a battle between these two schools of thought. And then both of these went ahead and then you had another very uh, a brilliant mind, one of the greatest minds of last century, Feynman, Richard Feynman, he came up and he brought with him Apart from playing bongo drums and cracking safes in Los Alamos, he came up with this new technology of uh, Feynman diagrams and things, and he made the first theory, the quantum theory of the interaction between photon, light, 
and the matter particles electrons, which is known as the theory of quantum electrodynamics, the theory of electron photon, the quantum theory of electron photon, and that, sorry? Photoelectric effect is just one of the manifestations. That was what uh, Einstein uh, worked with. We can revisit it later on. So that theory was the first theory, and that is actually the most precision theory in science, which is correct to about 15 or 16 decimal places. So you can understand that quantum mechanics is not just a random crazy guy's idea, like they said that these German guys were sitting and coming up with these theories in pubs, but it wasn't like that. There was a basis of these. So the mathematics that you have is indeed a powerful tool because if your mathematics is right, in some cases it won't translate to physical reality, but if your mathematics is right, most likely you have some physics or some reality down there. So anyway, his book, uh, Feynman Lectures in Physics, is like the Bible of physics, which every student has in his uh, library and goes through. And Feynman, before his death, even uh, gave the idea of nan nanotechnology, which was totally not the idea of his time. So that was pretty much, uh, pretty much pre-scient in, in his time. And finally, before his death, uh, he was the chairman of uh, Congress or Presidential Committee to uh, come up with an investigation how the Challenger accident, the Challenger uh, was destroyed. So he came up with the theory of O-rings, that O-rings had a problem. So he was the genius who shaped up. So these are then manifestation and the invention of transistor by uh, Shockley Bardi in Britain at Bell Labs. And then you have this picture especially I got. And uh, this is one of the beautiful pictures which I've always loved. In this picture, you can actually see an actual system of atoms. In front of you is iodine or iodine substrate on which are these cesium atoms, cesium atoms which are placed by hand. And the hand is actually the tip of a STM microscope, which you can see behind there. So this is how. So all these atoms and this knowledge of atoms is actually real. And this is all based on quantum mechanics. So these are the spin-offs of quantum mechanics, which helped us get to superconductivity. And this is a corral of, uh, if I'm not wrong, iron atoms that you can see actually uh, there. So similarly, Einstein's general theory of relativity, and these are the Einstein's field equations, the group of equations, the tensor form. And you have this great equation except one blunder, which Einstein called the greatest blunder of his life, this lambda that you have. So this great equation actually became the basis of the cosmological model that we have, because that is known as the lambda stadium model. So this, this equation, just to explain it in a simple manner, is this, that you have the energy or pressure because of a body, like this body, if it's in space-time, so once I place it somewhere, this energy pressure, this pressure because of this mass and pressure because of this bottle would create the space to change its shape, would affect the space-time to actually change its shape. So that's what the Einstein's tensor there uh, stands for. And the first solution for these equations came just after one year of Einstein's discovery or that paper in 1915 was by Carl Schwarzschild. And that solution was, is known as the Schwarzschild solution. And that solution is itself a singularity. Now singularity in layman words are infinities or undefined. You divide zero by anything. Your calculator gives you something like that. Or whenever you do any operations like this, it gives you an infinity. Or undefined, like we say uh, in, um, in a proper jargon. So this undefined, so these solutions which came out are known as black holes. So that is the basis of black holes that there are in fact, at the most basic form, singularities. They are undefined. They are something which is impossible to exist. So what a black hole is, if you go through it, it would require, I think, a lecture to go through. So once a star is shiny, it has fusion going on. These hydrogen nuclei, they're fusing together, making helium. So all this goes on till actually you go to the higher numbers of atoms. Once you go to, through the periodic table, you have simplest hydrogen atom, helium, lithium, and then you have all these atoms. Once you go above iron and like that, higher atomic number elements, what happens is then this whole star starts to collapse. Then this whole fashion in which a star is shining bright like we have our own sun. So then that's, that star spontaneously starts an implosion program. It starts a suicide program. It starts to implode in itself. So it starts imploding, imploding, till the stage where it's destroyed like a supernova. It is destroyed. Or 
it has such a great pull that all the mass is concentrated into a small point. So now you have a point which does not have a volume or an area. It's a point. And that point you have infinite mass. So that infinite mass in this negatively infinite area or space, that is what is called a black hole. So then you have this black hole and the only thing you can see from a black hole, because everything, once it becomes a black hole, just goes inside. It's a one-way traffic. If you go inside, you cannot return. Even the light cannot come back. It is the gravitational pull is so much immense that even the light cannot come back. All you can see is event horizon, like the window. You can see a, a house, but only its facade. You can see the door, the wall, the window. You don't know what, what really goes on inside. And it's maybe a notorious place. If you go inside, you're, you're dead, right? So that is something what, uh, and that radius of this black hole is called a Schwarzschild radius. And another unfortunate reality of life, within one year, uh, Schwarzschild died. Uh, because of, I think, some autoimmune disorder. And his son, again, he also became uh, an astrophysicist astronomer. So this is what a black hole looks like, and I'm sure all of you have seen pictures of black holes and they are devouring human beings. In Sun, there was a joke that it would create black holes which would eat up Geneva City and people were afraid of it, what would happen, but that's, that's all not possible. If a black hole exists, then it won't eat Geneva, it would perhaps eat all solar system and perhaps uh, maybe a part of, maybe the Perseus wing of uh, the Milky Way galaxy. So how do you actually look at these black holes? Because it might be just a theoretical fancy of scientists. Maybe I've just come up with some theory. You can actually see it just like once you have a lens, if you spray some, you know, like uh, water in it, in the water drop, droplets on that lens, you could see multiple images of the same thing. So that's the same thing which happens. The gravitation, it lenses, it bends the light. It is so powerful, the gravitational pull, the energy, or the force or the pressure is so immense that even the light bends down. So then once you have a black hole or a galaxy, and if a black hole is present uh, nearby in the vicinity, you would have multiple images of the same galaxy. So that actually indirectly tells you that there's, there is a black hole in the vicinity. And this, this, this process or this effect is called, or it is named as gravitational lensing. So this is how you see, and then once you go through some of the solutions in some particular ma matrix, you come out with wormholes. So these are Schwarzschild wormholes. They're no also known as Einstein Rosen, the same Rosen that I mentioned. So these are the wormholes through which you can actually traverse great distances. For instance, if you're here in Milky Way, and if you somehow found, found a black hole, and you can create a Rosen bridge, an ER bridge or a Rosen bridge, you can actually walk through it and reach Andromeda which is the nearest galaxy next to us. Or maybe you can traverse it to 10 billion years away, some, some other place, some unknown place. So these are again theoretical conjectures, these are theoretical ideas, but like I actually had sort of an idea, uh, a fallacy you can say that maybe our dreams are black holes as well because once we sleep that, that state of consciousness actually ports us to some strange dimensions and sometimes you see uh, objects which you have never seen before in your life. So maybe there are some worlds and you anyway have from string theory parallel universes and multiverses and things like that. So the, another spin-off of uh, the general theory of relativity was gravitational waves. So what are these gravitational waves? What was this so much ado about gravitational waves, Nobel Prize, the whole world, you know, coming on the headlines of every leading newspaper in 2015? Gravitational waves are the ripples in space-time itself. So you have like this rug. So you can see once you lay it down on floor, it would have some ripples. So if I try to pull one side, you would have either the ripples removed, the wrinkles, or you could create more wrinkles. So whenever there is a massive object, like a black hole, present in a particular space-time geometry, that black hole would affect the space-time itself, like a black hole merger, a black hole creation event, destruction event, or any other astronomical event of that magnitude which would create such a, an immense pull that it would alter or create a ripple in space-time. The space-time itself would change. Because remember, coming from the special theory of relativity and the general theory of relativity, space-time is not constant. It changes as per the mass or as per other conditions. So this is the ripples in space-time known as gravitational waves and this was actually what they referred to as the merger of two black holes that was discovered in 2015. So this is just a cartoon of that event. 
So how did they measure it? It is just a simple interferometry technique where you have two beams of laser, and it, of course, had a great challenge on the part of uh, uh, Barry Barish and his team, uh, including uh, Professor Manviwala, that these laser beams go all the way between these two cities, you know, from one state, which is in the southeast somewhere, and to this uh, on the west coast. So how do you actually maintain that laser beam while you have so much vibrations on ground, and everything and the cultural effects because of people, everything going on. So it was really a challenge and I think it took a decade or even more than a decade for them. So this is actually the technique with which you can see the path difference between two beams and from that you can infer that something happened. But you need a very large size beam, large size area because the effect is so feeble that you won't see it with a simple laser beam if I just lay it down here. So this was all this knowledge finally came up with something called the standard model of physics. You have the particles, antiparticles, and forces. So this is what really my field of work, what I do. What is the universe made of? What we all are made of? Are we made of protons, neutrons, electrons, photons? Just four particles? That's what we were taught in high school. In college, protons, neutrons, electrons, at least in my time, in your time, I mean, uh, in the new students, I think for the last 20 years, everybody knows about quarks. That protons, neutrons are not themselves uh, elementary particles, but they are made of quarks. So you have the standard model came up with, based on a lot of hard efforts, observations, measurements, very high precision measurements, work by Feynman, Gelman, all these people, the work goes inside. And then you have this model of the matter and radiation. So you have on left this, this lavender color group of six particles, which are the quarks, the six types of quarks, as Gelman called them, based on this uh, novel, uh, an Irish novel. So you have these six quarks, up, down, charm, strange, top, bottom. So there are three generations, three generations and six particles. And then corresponding to them, you have six particles in green. At the bottom, you have these three brothers dropping something down, I could move there. So you have three of these siblings, electron, mion, the Greek symbol for M, and then tau for T. So you have these Greek letters. So these are the three brothers. Electron is the tiniest, weak, weakest brother, the youngest brother. And you have the strong, very powerful energetic brother, which is mion. And you can see the difference from their masses. There's a large magnitude of difference between their masses. And then you have this big, heavy, rich guy who is their oldest brother, so which is a tau particle. So other than masses, they are all, all same. The spin, all the properties are same, but there are just masses. And then each of these brothers has his own sister who came with, it, with him from the heavens above. So you, these three small particles are called neutrinos, as poly, or if I'm not wrong, poly, uh, named them as the little neutral particles. So these little neutral particles are neutrinos, they have no charge. By the way, all these particles, electron, muon, tau, they all carry one magnitude of charge, and which is a negative. And then all these particles, all six, all 12 of these have antiparticles. So you can say there's a home in which there are all these, all these brothers who are all positive, all heroic and positive, and the other home next to them are all of these negative guys who are their brothers, but unfortunately, they're not the good guys. They are all the negative guys, something like that. So this is just a layman analogy that I could come up with. So every particle in universe, these matter particles, and all these 12 are actually the matter particles, which are the matter particles which constitute matter. The particles on top make up the nuclear particles, the particles which make up the nucleus, which are in the nucleus. For instance, up, down, up, these three in combination create a proton, and up, down, down, they create a neutron. And likewise, and then up, down, strange creates another particle, which is the lambda particle or sigma particle. And similarly, then you have all these particles created because combination, because of combinations of these matter particles. And then outside these, outside the nucleus are these particles, which are outside the nucleus, or extra nuclear particles, which are basically. So these particles outside are known as leptons, and these particles in the nucleus, which make up these particles, are called quarks. And then what you see this column on your right is the forces or interactions. These are the radiations. These are the particles 
of light or particles of waves or particle of radiation which mediate the effects between them. It is one of the basic laws of physics that you cannot have an effect like magic, that I do something here and over there I could see a light shining there. It is impossible scientifically. Something has to create an effect between these two. So something has to carry that force. If I take my this hand and put it on this object, there has to be a particle which mediates the force. So these four particles actually they are not actually four, they are gamma, at the top the particle of light, gluon, which glues on, combines the quarks together so that they can make up proton, neutron, they can make up a stable nucleus. And then you have the Z naught and two W plus and W minus, these are responsible for the weak force, the force which breaks a nucleus, which disintegrates nucleus. So that's how you have the four fundamental forces in nature. And this is just the symmetries. This is the work, by the way, by uh, these great people, Gelman, Neiman, and normalization by Salam. So this is the work of a lot of people. It cannot be attributed to one physicist. So this is like I, what I teach in my particle physics or nuclear physics class. You have an atom in the middle or in the center or somewhere, because you know, you cannot pinpoint with precision that where it is, but somewhere in the nucleus, and nucleus itself is a non-existing entity. This is just what we call as a nucleus. It's just a combination of these particles which are inside the nucleus and they are known as hadrons. So hadrons are the particles which are inside the nucleus and then they, they are all made up of quarks, different combination of quarks, like I said. So, and there are two types of them, baryons and mesons. So you can see proton, neutron, lambda, sigma, and then the mesons, the small particles which are, and there was a mesonic theory of uh, of nuclear theory of um, mesons, which was by Yukawa a long time ago. And then you see outside the nucleus, all these particles with their, with their own sisters or brothers like that. So this is what the standard model is. And these are the four forces, fundamental forces in nature. So whenever you see any electrical effect, like these lights or absorption of light, emission of light, all these effects, electricity, magnetism, they are mediated by electromagnetic force. Then you have the gravity, the weakest force, and actually all these four forces, that is what is known as a gravitational force. And then you have the weak force, which is responsible for disintegration of nuclei and objects. And then you have the strong force, which keeps the nucleus bound. I mean, which keeps these quarks and these baryons, these mesons, all of these bound together. So these are the four fundamental forces. So then there are theories like all these particles are not really particles, but they are just vibrating loops or you can say strings. So this is the string theory, which is a beautiful, really remarkable theory. Many people would insist that this is the true theory of uh, the phenomena in nature, but of course still it is not really uh, verified and there are some challenges which are uh, involved with verification. So what this theory says that proton, neutron, all these particles are just the same string. It is just a different kind of a dance, like Feynman would have said, would have said that these are just different orientation of these strings makes up them proton, neutron, photon, lambda, sigma, all these particles. So this is the string theory and it goes to really beautiful structures and it goes to the ideas. So this is, this physics is called the physics beyond the standard model. The supersymmetry, the string theory, the M theory, physics beyond the standard model, you would hear all these words referring to these theories which are not verified yet. This is not the standard model of physics, but they are the best possible candidates, I would say, even in my personal opinion. So these are the three revolution, quantum mechanics, theory of relativity, and the ideas of a new state of matter like superconductivity, which Kamerlings did. So then you discovered new states of matter because of all this knowledge. We just knew there's a solid, a liquid, and gas. And then we were taught in our school, there is a fourth state of, uh, in nature of, of matter, which is called plasma. So which is the fourth, uh, you, you know, fourth, uh, what do you call it? We call them phases. We, call, we don't call them kinds. They are phases of, the, of matter. So now you have another phase, which is called the Bose-Einstein condensate. What you do is you actually take atoms like cesium atoms or rubidium atoms, and you hit them with lasers. You have an optical trap and you hit them with lasers and each time the laser hits these atoms, it takes some energy from the atoms. And as you know, energy, the best form of energy which everything has, which I have, which all of you, which everything has, 
whichever is at some kind of temperature is the thermal energy. And that is also the noise which is there once you are trying to measure things, especially weak signals. So just like you have noise in your cell phone while talking, so this is the thermal energy which creates noise in every measurement possible that you do. So this, so finally because of this laser cooling, this is called laser cooling, you bring the temperature of these atoms down to about 10 to the power minus, if I'm not wrong, the last paper that I saw, 10 to the minus 12 kelvins. Very, very, very close to a zero. So you can understand it how cold it is. You have 273 degrees Celsius, which is, uh, sorry, 273 Kelvin, which is the zero degree Celsius. And then you have the room temperature right now, it would be 293 Kelvin. So you are going to 10 to the minus six and then minus nine, minus 12 Kelvin. And then this is another state of a beautiful form of phase of matter. So these revolutions actually uh, came up with a lot of wonderful things. So now finally, we come to the cosmological model, which is itself an extension to the physics, uh, physical models. So how do we have, do we have, so the question is, once we look at stars, the galaxies, do we have a model like physics where we have uh, some kind of, uh, where we have some kind of definite knowledge about what's going on in the universe, where we can know that how old we are, where we are getting through, are we really going towards a big crunch? where just like Big Bang, everything would come to an end, to a single dot, to a single point. So that is, then this is fourth or fifth revolution, as I would say, if you will. So we do have a model for cosmology. Cosmology is the science of origin, evolution, and the final fate of universe. How do we study how the universe began, how it evolved, what were the eras? As you know, the Earth, the history of Earth is 4.77 billion years, plus minus uh, degree of error. So, and then the, before 4.77 billion years, what happened really before the Earth was here? And what happened before the solar system was there? What happened before the Milky Way was there? And then what, most importantly, what's going to happen? What is really going on right now? What kind of era are we in? Are we in an era of inflation? Or a static universe? Or a deflate? universe in which actually we are contracting. So these are all kind of questions that we discuss in cosmology and the most reliable or most, or you can say the only scientific body of knowledge that talks about cosmology is the scientific cosmology is the lambda CDM model. So this lambda CDM model is made of lambda, the cosmological constant that Einstein called his blunder. What Einstein was doing while trying to make the equations, I'm not really a theorist, I'm not, I was not trained in uh, uh, gravitation, but of course I've been trained in quantum field theory and many things and I've taken interest. So while he was trying to make equations, field equations, he tried to put a constant so that he could have a peaceful universe. So you have whatever happened in the past, let's forget about it, we are too old now to remember. So he wanted a peaceful universe which was static, a universe which was still. Of course we are revolving and then the, this arm of um, Milky Way like Vera Robin herself calculated I think which was some, some miles, a big number per hour or per day the way this arm is going. So the way we are moving and then we are moving ourselves like Kepler correctly calculated in Newtonian or classical physics, uh, the speed with which we are revolving and we are rotating. But he wanted the universe to be static a peaceful universe which was static. So that's why you put a constant, just like you put a constant equation, they're okay, this is a constant. This is proportional to this, okay, the tensor, the energy momentum tensor is equal to this, blah, 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 to the curvature. And then you have the constant, a beautiful constant to keep everything okay. But later on what it turned out, because of the observations that universe was not static. We've had inflationary eras before, and we're going through an inflationary era again. And in between, there was a constant sort of static. It wasn't, wouldn't be static, but we had a peaceful era before. So this cosmological constant coupled with something called, so this cosmological constant later on came to know as a dark energy that propels the expansion of this universe. So you can say it's a variable now, it's no more a constant, but it's an important variable. And you saw its value was there, it has a value, and which denotes that it's an inflationary universe. If it were negative or something, then we would mean that it's a contractional universe, we are actually contracting. So that body of knowledge, and then coupled with cold dark matter. So this is uh, actually the 
topic of tonight's talk. What I really wanted was that people told me that there are not enough talks about particle physics or cosmology. So I thought to add a little bit of knowledge of particle physics to it so that you can appreciate what's going on in CERN, in Jefferson Lab at Stanford, et cetera, et cetera. So this cold dark matter model is a second component of this theory which is actually the de facto theory right now of cosmology and which explains very much the structure of the cosmic microwave background. I'm going to talk about it now. What is this background? Why we are here? And then the large scale structures, the abundances of light elements in universe. So it pretty much explains many observations that we have. So it all started with these two excellent missions, the Explorer 66 as NASA called it, which was the COBE, the mission. These were the space bound uh, probes. So you had Kobe and this Planck and, the, it was, and there was another one in between which was, uh, so this actually, once they were sent in space and there was a purpose of sending them, they actually charted a picture, a whole survey of the sky. Beyond our atmosphere, they made a survey of the sky and they came up with, with a temperature or a sound or you can say there's a hissing once you go in space, you hear, in the silence of space, you hear a hissing. Or you feel a temperature. In the, cold, in the cold expanses of universe, you feel a temperature which is there. So it's sort of an after effect. Like you had your hot coffee, you took it. Once you pick the mug from there, you find a temperature on the rock. So this is called the relic of the relic radiation from the Big Bang. So this is the radiation which is left over when the universe began. So they saw this microwave radiation which is everywhere in space. The story of uh, microwave, uh, this uh, cosmic microwave backgrounds began with uh, a very simple uh, experiment which is going on. They were trying to test a new uh, radio frequency receiver, a microwave uh, receiver in Bell Labs and they were constantly getting a signal which they thought initially was noise. But finally they heard somebody that physicists have been talking about that there is a kind of a microwave or maybe some other frequency, some spectral region. So that's how, and then finally it was joined. You can see the beauty of the efforts by people like Max Planck that this plot of this radiation present in space coincides beautifully with the spectrum of black body radiation which actually Planck discovered first. So that was the thing on which these uh, people got Nobel Prize for discovery of this cosmic microwave background. And then this was another uh, Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe, WMAP. So uh, they all made a survey of the universe, the visible universe, and they found out that in universe there are these, and they charted, they make, made a chart, they made a plot of these energies, or temperature you can say, or frequencies, because they all translate to the same uh, measurement, to the same variable, or the same observable. So they all charted, although Kobe was more coarse and then Planck and WMAP, and they saw this map of the universe, just like you have the map of Earth, once you open the, the circular spherical geometry of Earth, and you can show it on a, on a, on a piece of paper, on a two-dimensional object, you show Americas to be here, then Africa's, Europe, and then you show everything on one piece of paper, but in effect, the, the Earth is a three-dimensional sphere. So similarly, this is a three-dimensional sphere, the picture of the cosmic microwave background, which is a miracle in itself. There are a number of implications. You see that this energy which came out, which they saw, is starting from about 400,000 years after the Big Bang, when, you know, the fusions going on, the universe cooled down a bit. So this is, and what you see there are these black voids, and you see these, so here, Actually, the legend is this, red denotes the highest energy, most energetic, the hottest temperature which they could measure. And then this is the whole view of the sky, the universe which could be seen outside. So then, and the black or the blue are the coldest regions. These are the coldest regions. So what you gather from this, the first thing is, looking at the red shift, the Doppler shift, once I'm, if I come to you with this mic speaking, if I approach you, if I go close to the, to you because of the Doppler effect, the frequency increases, the pitch increases of my, my voice. If I go away from you, the pitch decreases. So when we go towards, if you look at the spectrum, the blue is the highest, the higher energies, and the red is the lower energies. Red goes towards infrared, and blue or 
Also, our violet goes to the ultraviolet, to the higher energy. So whenever something is coming to us, we would see it with higher frequencies. And whenever something is receding from us, we would observe it with frequency which is lowering down, which is lowering down. So you see that, so from that and all this data they gathered, the most scientific, the most exact measure of the age of universe is 13.77 billion years with a degree of error or degree of imprecision in it. So, and then they found out that this radiation is anisotropic. This is not the same in every direction. So all these things, I don't have much time right now, so I'll try to, uh, I've had 50 minutes already gone, so I'll try to wrap up my talk after uh, all these. So similarly, this beautiful uh, piece of equipment which was sent back there in uh, 1990, this Hubble telescope, which went above, and you know, these telescopes are not just visible telescopes. They don't, they don't just have eyes like us. They have eyes which are X-rays as well. They have eyes which are infrared as well. They have eyes which are microwave antennas like our cell phones as well. So they can measure, they can actually see microwave radiation, they can see infrared radiation, they can see visible radiation, they can see X-rays, and they can even see gamma rays, depending on what kind of uh, experiments or what kind of spectroscopy systems you have put on the payload which went up to the space. So this, uh, this shuttle was named in the, to honor this great astronomer, which is perhaps the most, uh, I would say the greatest of all in modern astronomers, Edwin Hubble, the American astronomer, who actually discovered inflation that we are going through an inflationary era. So this telescope once started to chart the sky, they discovered that, they discovered spectra or images which once they were analyzed, because you know astronomy is not just looking at the sky. Astronomy is a whole field, it's a whole science. It has a lot of technology, it has programmers, it has engineers, it has physicists, it has astronomers, it has mathematicians, it has theorists, all kind of people. So they started to gather that. Back there, there were some claims by Poincaré and Lord Calvin, like Poincaré had suggested that there's a matter obscure as dark matter which exists in universe which we cannot see. Similarly, in 1933, the Swiss astronomer Fritz Zwicky suggested that there are, while he studied uh, some clusters, especially the comma cluster, so he studied and he found out a discrepancy about four, he found that the universe which was visible had really, should have had 400 times more mass in it. And how would you know that there's a mass in a universe or a cl cluster? You would know it how would you know? Okay, kids, how would you know? You cannot see it, right? How would you know? Something is out there, how would you know? When you cannot see. How would a blind know? By touch, by sound, okay? But you cannot, if there is no sound, because dark matter would not create a sound. The way light bends and the gravitational. So the way you can actually see objects are using gravitational pull. So once they do, did calculations, they said the gravitational pull which is making these lensing is not really, ex that does not explain the mass which is there which we can see from the spectra, from the visible spectra. So he termed as, because he was Swiss, so uh, German Swiss, so he called it Dunkel Matier, Maturi, which is a dark matter. And then finally, in the 1970s, this great astronomer, Vera Rubin, was struggling again with a huge organization with the men's world. She was studying these rotational curves of galaxies, and finally he found out the way these galaxies are rotating. They have much, much higher velocities in the arms as compared to center. You have a merry-go-round, a huge merry-go-round. You can imagine, even from Kepler's laws, from physics, from the intuition, the outermost arms would be slow, right? as compared to the innermost uh, circles. So the velocity of the outward objects, which are in the outermost arms, like in the outermost arms of the Milky Way, the galaxy in which we are in, they should be moving with a slower rotational velocity. When she found, actually, once she looked at her interview, the video, she charted the velocities and she had a nice plot in which she saw the velocities of these arms, and finally she enunciated. Oh, so these are the pictures of uh, is it gone? Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, okay, we're back. So this was the great lady, Vera Rubin, and this was Zwicky. So finally, she enunciated there's a dark matter. So she was the first person to come up with a
cogent theory of dark matter. And if at all dark matter is ever observed, she would get a Nobel Prize, but posthumously, because unfortunately she died two years ago. So she was that great person. She even suggested that our galaxy, our galaxy or the galaxies are immersed in, I wanted to show that, uh, okay. So this is basically this cartoon which shows a blue halo. So she enunciated that our universe or the galaxy, not universe, I'm sorry, the galaxy is immersed in a dark matter halo. So today while thinking about it, how do I come up with an analogy to explain to you how this is? So I came up with the idea of a sponge. Sponge. All the men who have ever done cooking, cleaning at homes are familiar with, or people like me who live alone. The sponge, the cleaning sponge, any sponge, you take it, soak it in water, what happens? You inflate it again, the sponge is there, but now its mass has increased. It has accumulated all the water in it. So like that, this, the space-time in a galaxy is flooded with dark matter. So dark matter is not actually really like the sun in the center of solar system. That okay, there's a sun or there's something in the center of solar system or in the center of uh, the galaxy. It is actually a halo in which the galaxy itself is immersed. So you can say that while we are talking here, apart from all other kind of beings who can be there, there are particles, there are particles around us, maybe inside us, or going through us like neutrinos, because neutrinos are notorious to go through the Earth a number of times without getting detected, because they have, they have a very, low, very, very low cross-section of interaction with matter. So similarly, this dark matter perhaps has even lower, perhaps in a way you can say, cross-section than neutrinos. So this dark matter is all around us, all around and inside the galaxy, which this galaxy is immersed in. So these were the ideas from this great lady called Vera Rubin. So this is what she talked about, that these are the galactic rotational curves, and I explained to you that the way this galaxy is rotating, because you know what's happening is this, that inflation means all the galaxies, everything is receding. And in the summary, when I summarize everything, I'll give you the, the big picture, I'll try to give you the big picture, what's happening in our opinion, what we all think, what you all think. And believe me, your guess is as good as mine because nobody knows for sure what's going on except a very little body of knowledge that we have. So these rotational curves, velocities, they all finally pointed towards presence of a dark matter. So the question is, what if this is really an ordinary matter that we have not been able to measure? Maybe people like me, the particle, physis the particle physicists like me, have been really, really, uh, really, you know, unable, unqualified, maybe just, you know, uh, not really uh, intelligent enough or not really hardworking enough to have measured this matter. But it's not like that. We have the theory of baryons, mesons, quarks, gluons, photons. These are all pretty good theories in which you have this evidence of all the observational data that we have. So if this dark matter really existed, if it were a baryonic matter, it would definitely interact with baryons, with the baryonic matter. Baryonic matter means the visible matter, the matter which is inside the nucleus, made of baryons. So we know that we would have the signature of this. You could also, somebody could also say this could be the antimatter. I told you there's a matter, there's antimatter. For electron, you have positron. You go, unfortunately, if somebody, you know, has cancer, is going through chemotherapy or surgery, whatever. If you'd like to see the prognosis of his treatment, you might, uh, the doctor might suggest a PET scan. So what is PET scan? A PET scan is basically a positron emission tomography scan in which an isotope is injected. That isotope goes in the body, especially at that preferential uh, region. It has preferential absorption. And finally, it would start emitting positrons. These positrons, for instance, in the brain, once they come across electrons, so the property of antimatter is as soon as it encounters matter, it would annihilate. You've studied the annihilation of matter in physics, um, which is called pair production, pair annihilation, two photons, they can, a photon, if it goes through a heavy nucleus nearby, a heavy nucleus like lead, this photon would annihilate and generate two, a pair of electron and positron. So if this ball is made of lead, 
and if I shine a light, but not ordinary light, but gamma rays, it should have enough energy. At least more than 1.0 to 2 MeV, bless you. So this gamma rays comes, and once it comes near this, this ball of lead, this light would die. Light cannot, can never die. So what it happens is it converts, or energy cannot die. That's the first law of thermodynamics. Energy cannot die, it cannot be produced. Similarly, matter cannot be made, nor it can be annihilated. It always converts among different states or phases. So this photon annihilates and creates a pair of electron and positron. Similarly, when these electron and positron come across each other, once they collide, they annihilate, and they end up generating two photons. So this is called pair annihilation. So similarly, if the antimatter is there, if all this dark matter is antimatter, we would know that it exists because of its interactions with electrons and the kind of gamma rays we would observe. So it's not really antimatter, it's not really baryonic matter. It cannot be galaxy-sized black holes because black holes have a specific kind of gravitational lensing. Once astronomers look at the spectra, because they're trained in it, once they analyze it, they would know that the structure that is there, creating these multiple images of the galaxy nearby or the star nearby, is a black hole. That spectrum, that properties of that data would differ from dark matter. So that theory is also rejected, that it cannot be black holes. So finally, it, uh, it was decided or suggested that these are, these, this dark matter is made of exotic particles, and there are two candidates which are the best candidates for this dark matter. One is called WIMPs, weakly interactive massive particles. Now weakly meaning they're not like weak, what it means is that they are as per the weak interaction. Their, their interaction is weak, they follow the laws of weak interaction, and they're massive particles, they're extremely heavy. So these particles are actually there, and it seems quite plausible that these particles are there, and I would tell you in a bit that why this theory is not that strong theory as well, but these WIMPs are the best candidate out there, and the second candidate, which I and a couple of my, actually a lot of my colleagues are working in this, are called the axions. So this is the other particle of uh, dark matter, which we have, or people before me suggested, as axions. So they have, people have come up with two kinds of candidates, either they could be WIMPs, or they could be axions. So these axions are then cold dark matter and WIMPs are then hot dark matter or something like that. And hot here means not really uh, hot in terms of temperature. Hot means these are relativistic particles. They're very fast speed, high speed. And then the cold dark matter particles like axions are very light speed. They're light in terms of velocity. They're slow moving. So these are, and slow here means they're less than about 10% of the speed of light. So these are then two candidates that we have. And then this is an image uh, made of the universe when it started from Big Bang. There was a Big Bang and now there are controversial, you know, different theories that Big Bang is either, there was, a, there was an explosion which started Big Bang or there was a singularity similar to a black hole, like I have thought about it that you have sort of pumped somebody, somebody pumped an infinite amount of energy in an infinitely small region of space. And that gave the way to the creation of universe. So in a way you're trying to say that you have an event which had an infinite energy density. You had sort of infinite energy, because that energy is, you're seeing everywhere today. That's the energy I have, which you all have, which stars have, which converted into matter. Because energy converts to matter, I just told you, and matter converts to energy. They keep changing. And actually, as per quantum field theory, there's no matter, there's no radiation. It's all quantum fields. Everything's a vibration. That's the base of universe. Everything is a vibration. And that, in my opinion, takes you to the realms of more epistemological questions, philosophical ideas, that the base of everything is information. There was an information which translated into energy, into that uh, event, which finally turned into the event which is known as the Big Bang. Now many people won't be happy with this kind of theory because it brings in the idea of an intelligent, crea 
creation, that there was some intelligent being that Newton talked about, or that even Einstein referred to as the old one. As the old one. He always referred to God as the old one. So that's one theory. The other theory is the traditional theory of Big Bang. People, most of the people think, oh, okay, you always show Big Bang as an, a massive explosion. There was a massive explosion in the universe that gave way to this creation. So anyway, so these theories, so you have Big Bang and then you have this, uh, this, the early epochs, the early eras, the early periods of the creation after Big Bang when the new universe was made, what happened in the first femtoseconds, first second, first millisecond, first ten seconds, first minute, people have actually calculated that. There are calculations and you can, with some kind of precision, if not completely with high precision, you can actually predict what was going on, how quarks, gluons, they all, you know, were formed and fused together. So in the start you see there was sort of an expansion from a point, it expanded and then again it became steady and then again recently, in recent millions of years, we're going through an inflationary era. So the purpose of showing this was to show you that at the start of the universe, when the universe was about roughly 400,000 years old, this was the proportion of dark matter and visible matter and the radiation, the photons. So you had about 63% of dark matter, about 10% neutrinos, the light, the photons, whether gamma or whatever kind of light it was, were about 15%, and the atoms themselves, all the atoms clumped together or whatever, were about 12%. And then, after 13.77 billion years, what we see today is about, or we calculate, we infer, or we postulate, is that about 70% of the universe content is dark energy, about roughly 27% is dark matter, and then you have about 4.9% atoms. So this is a theory of dark matter which really disturbed everybody because uh, what you have is that everything that we see, all the galaxies and everything, is hardly 5%. It's hardly 5%. And then everything else is just dark matter and dark energy. So that's the first thing. That's the first thing that upsets you. And you get worried that everything you see on, the, on a clear sky, once there's no dust, if you go above at high altitude, you could see, you know, all these stars, constellations, galaxies, planets, but unfortunately still you cannot see much. You can only see 5%. The second thing what you see is that in the start the dark matter was 63%, roughly, uh, roughly two-thirds, and then now what you have is most of it has converted into dark energy. So somehow this dark matter has given way to dark energy. So you can conjecture in a way, and that might be a good guess, that this dark matter has been being consumed, is being consumed in making structures, making dark structures, or having interactions with visible structures. And finally, it is leaving behind a dark energy. It is leaving behind dark energy, which never existed in the first place. So once, I mean, if you have a cosmologist, this, if you have a cosmologist, he could tell you really in a nice manner how it all started, what were the errors. I'm not a cosmologist, but I've tried to sum up things in a, in a terse manner. So then this is the halo of dark matter. So kinds of dark matter, then there are two, like I said, uh, this hot dark matter. So they've suggested this hot dark matter is mostly neutrinos. But once you look at the character of neutrinos or the properties of neutrinos, especially these neutrinos, had been relativistic. Relativistic mean, meaning approaching the speed of light. So they would have been extremely fast. So once you are having this event of Big Bang, and from Big Bang you have all these particles coming out, so you have this great train of neutrinos, because that's what the dark matter was. So if there are really neutrinos, they would stream out, they would go out in all directions with extremely high speed and they would make a uniform sky. If you go back to the microwave background radiation, you see these ripples, you see irregularities, you see anisotropies. The densities of space-time are different in different directions, at different places. So you would instead see, once a COBE goes out there, would see, okay, there's a smooth microwave radiation. The temperature that is dominant is about 2 Kelvin, 2.2 Kelvin. So you would see just 2.2 Kelvin. You won't see 4 Kelvin somewhere, somewhere 10 Kelvins, so on and so forth. So that actually 
rejects and once you go through that you do calculations that really goes out so finally what it comes is that the model which really corresponds to the reality what we observe and what you infer from the cosmic microwave background is that the hot dark matter is a very small percentage of dark matter maybe just one or two percent very little so most of the dark matter which is there that leaves the fertile grounds for people like us or for people like you if you're interested to build experiments you should never especially students they should never underestimate uh, their efforts uh, like when I look back I think when you cross 40 you are in the senior citizens uh, space so I'm one of you so but these guys who are back there here you have the greatest potential the best work that I did in my life the best scientific work was when I was in my mid 20s and then but I was again a student, I did not know a lot, so a lot of that was really uh, wishful thinking. And the best scientific work that I did of my life was really when I was in my PhD days, which was in mid-30s. So the best work that you can do in your life is your mid-20s. It does not mean I know people who did medicine after doing PhD in physics. So they went on, they were crazy, and they... Uh, and actually I did that too, I also went ahead and took MCATs after my PhD. So people did medicine, I know a friend of mine is an ophthalmologist, he does eye surgery and is also in our, he was a research faculty in our department having PhD from, uh, from I think PhD from Harvard and his MD from Duke and his uh, residency from WashU at St. Louis. So he was at all these best places in the US. So you can do everything. There are people who went into medical school as 50s or 60s. You can do it. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is this, that 20s or 30s is the best part of your life once you can do a lot of work. And then you need old people, old guys like me to guide, guide you, just hold your hand. And that's what advisors do. That's what my advisor did. And that's the same thing which I do with my students. So finally, we found that most of the dark matter is the cold dark matter, the slow dark matter. And then it has light and heavy. So heavy is which is higher mass and light which is the lower mass. So then also the, there is this, this is just from my recent talk which was a technical talk. So this is just this scary equation of all these monstrous elements are not just, re, uh, not really that uh, crazy stuff. This is a Lagrangian, the total energy. The energy E, you replace it with L, the total energy of a system in the quantum chromodynamics, the theory of quarks and, and gluons. So that gives you also the hints of dark matter. What you see is that this theory should have some space for charge and parity violations. I mean, if you replace something, my hand is like this. If I replace it like this, it's a parity operation. If you replace a electron and electron with positron, it's a charge operation. So you have operators. So this kind of violation should be there. And this violation was not seen. So people were really wondering. So somebody came up, Pecky Quinn, came up with a suggestion which is called the PQ or Peggy Quinn solutions, uh, that there is a particle called axion and later on this axion was connected to the dark matter. So axion was itself suggested from particle physics uh, community and then, and they suggested this axion decays into two photons. So if you have a dark matter particle and if I, if I have, if I come up, if you come up with some kind of gas, if you in your lab or like my dad, a chemist in his lab can come up with a compound with which an axion interacts, it would emit two gammas. And then somebody like me could detect those gammas because that's what we do in our every, everyday life. That's what uh, we have, our, that's what we do. So if you have any volume of space, to, uh, space and in which you have some medium that could, in, that could interact with dark matter and facilitate its conversion, it could convert into a pair of Photons. So that's one of the ways you can detect uh, these uh, dark matter particles or axions. So this is a triangle diagram borrowed from Feynman diagrams. Uh, so these are kind of experiments. The most popular one is in the Sanford Labs in an underground mine in South Dakota in US which is called the Lux experiment. So you can see all these people wearing bunny suits because you would like to have a very, very uh, clean environment which where there's nothing left. And actually people like my advisor suggested that in order to detect dark matter, especially uh, on these lines, you need to go in space. Because after Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Fukuyama, Pakistan, India, whatever, everybody who did experiments, nuclear experiments, the environment is no more clean. Everything has been 
Everything has been contaminated. So if I take really this water and I try to detect dark matter with it, so the gammas which I might detect because the signal is going to be very weak, they could be actually from the remnant radioactivity from maybe Nagasaki, maybe Hiroshima, maybe from some country. So that's why some people have suggested you have to go in space to actually measure uh, this kind of dark matter. So these are a couple of experiments which are going on all over the world. I have just tried to uh, gather here two or three where they've built these observatories with many kind of detectors. And in particle physics, normally you have either charged particle detectors to detect electrons, positrons, protons, or you have uncharged particle detectors to detect mainly gamma or neutrons. Neutrons do not interact much, so mainly you have gammas. So you have then scintillators, you have uh, straw chambers, and actually those of you, I was telling my niece uh, to make a project to have a small Giger counter for instance, God forbid you have a nuclear accident or something, you could have, you could have a small giga counter in your home to actually measure how much radiation is there. God forbid if there is some attack, again, God forbid. So you could at least have small chambers, ion chambers, and you can make them in, as part of high school projects. So these are just, you know, large size generalizations of these small, these basic concepts. So these are different, my advisor, he's part of this dark side uh, experiment. Um, from University of Houston. So this is the experiment I'm a member of, which is APEX for A prime, which is a dark matter photon, which we are trying to, uh, to discover. And this is at Jefferson National Labs, where I actually, uh, I'm a user, a scientist member. Uh, I take part in experiments. I've been taking part experiments there since I was a PhD student 14 years ago. So, so we have this beam of electrons and coming here, it hits a target and then you try to find the debris, you have as usual detectors all around it, and you try to detect it. So this is a tungsten detector. It's a very unconventional detector. You don't have such kind of geometries as uh, detectors in particle physics. And you'd be very much surprised that this detector was designed, its design was done by high school student. So we have in Jefferson Lab, and if you are interested high school students, you could come. In summer, we have workshops where we have these students who come there, we show them accelerators. The same activity goes on in Sun in Geneva. And nearly all, uh, when, we were, uh, when I was in Manchester, we had an activity like this. So this is just a glimpse of that experiment. So then, <clears throat> there's this physicist called Skevi, Pierre Skevi, a bright guy. So he suggested there's a special kind of axions, which are called Skevi axions. He said that, in order to facilitate this detection experiment that we are trying to build here, uh, I hope Arif would not <laughs> mind. So if you're trying to build this experiment, if you do it in a strong magnetic field, you're more likely to find it. So this was the start of these experiments and I actually uh, became involved uh, with my own experiment and also one collaboration. So here, this is the, just the probability. This is one of my technical slides. So what you have is a cavity, just like you're in this room. If there are not many people sitting here. If I speak loudly, there'll be echo. So you can create a resonance in a cavity. So you take a super fine, a very uh, fine cavity made of copper, like I have this co uh, cavity in my hands. So you take a copper cavity and you polish it and things like that. And then once you close it and you put it in a magnetic field, and if you have a sensitive piece of instrumentation, you can actually force these axions which are coming, traversing through this cavity or present in the cavity to create a resonance in the presence of a magnetic field. So this is the main uh, tenet of this detection. And then you have this magnet, like the superconducting magnet, in which you dip this cavity. So this is called the cavity-based detection experiments. The first was accelerator or reactor-based experiments. And these are actually the cavity-based experiments. So this is the original ADMX experiment, which is the pioneer in this uh, kind of detection. Iskivi himself is a member of this. So you have a large cavity of copper and you have tuning rods in it to change its resonance frequency because we don't know what frequency the resonance would happen. So that's another challenge. We know the mass of electron, we know the frequency it has or the wavelength it has. We know the mass of proton, we know the frequency a proton vibrates or dances with. But for axions, we don't know what frequency or mass is. So we, there is a tuning mechanism with which you tune the frequency. So you do a complete scanning, just like on TV or on radio, you scan the frequencies. So similarly, you scan the cavity for all the possible frequencies, and wherever you pick a signal, that would be 
that would make your day. And then you have an amplifier, superconducting amplifiers, and then electronics amplifiers, similar to the amplifiers you have in cell phones or in your mobile phone companies, because all this is done at microwave frequencies. So I also suggested a mass, and I have also my experiment. So this is again from ADMX. This is the actual experiment. You have a dilution refrigerator. Dilution refrigerator is a refrigerator in which you cool down objects to very low temperatures, even to milli or micro kelvins. And normally you can even go very easily to uh, like about one Kelvin, but you can actually go down to micro Kelvin. So this is all instrumentation. So this is put the detectors because the amplifiers are working at superconducting. Uh, they're made of superconducting technology. They need superconducting temperatures, which is like the liquid helium temperatures about four Kelvin or less. So that is in order to eliminate the thermal noise. Once you go down, you bring the noise floor down of your measurements. So that brings the noise down and then you can, so this is my experiment which I suggested in which you have a cavity and magnets and you have, I came up with a new uh, technique to measure the signal, not to actually detect the axions but just to facilitate in that measurement technology. So this is my uh, overview of uh, instrumentation involved with uh, the detection and this is just for the knowledge of people who are from engineering and physics just to make them happy. Okay, so this is then magnets. You can make these magnets at home. These are available at many places uh, and then using these magnets you can make a specific arrangement. This is called a Hallbach magnet in which you put magnets in particular orientation and then you have a maximum field in the center of this torus or donut and you have no field outside. So you have concentrated all the field of these magnets in the center. Now, it can go up to six or seven Tesla. I made in my lab for testing for about 1.48 Teslas, but the challenge there is that there won't be much uniformity and you need a very uniform magnetic field. So this won't work. This I just included for the students for their inspiration. So this is kind of things, I, it took me four years to educate myself in RF engineering because I've been doing electronics since my high school, but I never touched RF. So RF is totally different from analog electronics, linear electronics, digital electronics. So this is kind of things I started to build and finally I had to throw everything out that I built because there was so much noise. I could not really fabricate these things with which the machines make them. So finally I threw them all and I ordered off the shelf amplifiers, filters, detectors made by um, manufacturers. And then I have, this is just a room temperature amplifier and then you have these superconducting amplifiers which have very, very low noise. And you need very low noise and then you have to add a stage of a squid. Squid is one of the most sensitive magnetic uh, detection or sensing instruments in the world. So after SRF, SRF are more sensitive than them but that is a different technology. So what you can really afford is these squids. So I made these detectors, all this, and this is my rig uh, in my university where I have my own lab. So you put everything in a Faraday cage so that signals from mobile phones don't interfere. And then you have precision equipment like these lock-in amplifiers, signal generators, spectrum analyzers, and the whole system is so much sensitive that where you see zeros and maybe 100, 10 or something, as soon as somebody outside my lab has a cell phone, or a Wi-Fi hotspot, you start getting these crazy numbers, my all instruments just go crazy. So it is that kind of a sensitive uh, rig that you have. But still it's not sensitive because the expected power of a signal that you would measure or the measurement capability or noise floor that your instrument should have or the expected signal strength of an axion signal is about on the order of one yocto watt. Yocto means 10 is over minus 21 watts. And what I'm talking about right now, this signal is about 10 decibels. Yocto corresponds to about minus 180 or maybe minus 200 decibels. So it's extremely, extremely, extremely weak signal. So that's why you need to have, that's why you have so many challenges of instrumentation, of low temperature physics, and that's where the cryogenics come in. You need to have these liquid nitrogen and liquid helium uh, towards instruments, cryostats in which you carry out this experiment. So dark matter research is not easy. It's extremely challenging and again, there's no surety that whether these particles really exist or not. But that's what we do science and we use science for fun like they say. So this is actually a nice plot from my uh, instrument. 
response of injected signal. I hope and I pray someday I could be lucky to get a dark matter signal like this. And I hope everybody would believe in it. So that's again a very ambitious thing. That was one of our papers which received a pretty good response and uh, in which we published uh, these test results with instruments. The signal was of course injected by hand by our signal generator just to test that whether your system is working or not like the LIGO people used to do. So what about dark energy? So for dark energy there are a couple of theories. It is a property of the space itself. This is property of space itself or it is perhaps a zero point energy. It is perhaps a zero point energy that Max Planck's uh, formula and finally the energy values that you get out of Schrodinger equation, you get a, no a floor for everything. The lowest possible energy which can exist is the zero point energy. Now itself, it is an interesting concept. There is a lot of science fiction about it. If you go and Google it, you would find people who claim to have engines who exploit the zero point energy and they can propel you to space and what not. But this zero point energy is a property of vacuum. So it, it was one of the manifestations or implications of quantum electrodynamics that the vacuum is not a void. That's another thing, another property of vacuum. So vacuum is not a void. We all expected that once you have a vacuum chamber, you pull out air, you can create a pressure and then you have vacuum. You can do your experiment inside but it turns out vacuum is not empty. It's not a void. Vacuum has an energy which is present there and this energy is called the zero point energy. If you look at the formula itself, E equals to H nu, it's a generalization. The formula is E equals to N plus half brackets H nu. So you have N equals to one means the first energy level. For instance, an electron is at rest in an atom, in a hydrogen atom. A photon comes in and excites that photon if it has the specific energy to the first level and then to the second and th to the third and as you know quantum mechanics is the discrete. It's not the continuum, it's the discrete world. That's another property. So what you have is that while the, there is this absence of any excitation or s stimulation from outside, still vacuum has a minimum energy that it maintains. So that energy is equal to half H nu. So that is the zero point energy or the ground state energy. So once you add all, for instance, if I empty this bottle, if I make vacuum in it, if I add all the points, all the points or all the possible, all the possible space, if I integrate over the space, then what I get is I'll get a number. Similarly, I can add all this energy in the universe and it should give you the number that should correspond to the cosmological model. But it turns out that once you add, once you do the calculations of cosmological constant and all this, you get a number which is 10 raised to 1 to 0. 10 raised to 120. That means like you would see in any cosmology lecture about 120 zeros. That's such a big number which doesn't make any sense. So. So they have called this as vacuum energy, that perhaps this dark energy is the property. This is that intrinsic property of vacuum which is called the zero point energy or the ground state. And then some people, when I started studying this subject maybe 15 years ago, at that time I saw this word called quintessence or fifth element from the Greek uh, philosophy. That this is the fifth element, this is actually the fifth element which Greeks referred as this is another kind of force that creates an energy and this is the force at action in universe. Now you can call it anything, you know, like I said, it's all speculative. So these are different possibilities. Another possibility which is the other possible theory and these guys sort of hate us and we sort of don't like them, I mean not personally, but this theory is called MON, Modified Newtonian Dynamics. What they say is that the Newton's law of gravitation or the Newton's law F equals to GMM over R square Actually, it holds till some extent of gravitational, you know, mass or energy, after which the law breaks and then it is modified. So these theorists actually came up with a new body of theories which are called the Mond theories. They've modified the Newtonian, uh, they've modified the Newtonian gravitation and they said that the Newtonian gravitation is only valid till what we observe and then it has other forms. So this, again, a lot of people said that this really cannot be scientific, cannot be physical, but still they have models in which they suggest that this is actually the reason and dark matter is not really the reason for those curves and rotational uh, velocities of 
galaxies. So anyway, to sum it up, I'm sorry for taking too much time, but now comes the best part. So this is, so this is what really happened. There was a singularity, something which happened 13.77 billion years ago that created this expansion and creation of universe and then universe started to expand. There were dark ages. First stars were formed about 400 million years after the Big Bang, the first 400 million years, when the first stars were formed. And then they started to form and then the stars clumped together and the galaxies were formed. And that is actually in itself one of the biggest uh, fact, motivating factors for dark matter, that if this dark matter were not present there, the, the mass in galaxies would not be sufficient to clump them together in galaxies. Then you would have just individual stars. You would, you would have sun, you would have earth, everything, but you won't have these galaxies. You would have just dots everywhere. Once you look at the sky, you would have no more galaxies. So the galaxies themselves are clumped because of the immense mass that these dark matter particles have, or because of the dark energy which exists there. And not sorry because of dark energy. Dark energy is the reason it propels the universe. These clumping would have not been there if it were not for the dark matter. So dark matter was actually responsible for clumping them together. And then finally we have come up a long way, 13.77 billion years, plus minus some error. Uh, so I tried to make sort of a pseudo simulation. I'm not really an animation kind of a person. I, this is just my effort to try to show to you that there was a dot and dot was followed by a particular volume of space and time that gave way to the fusion and fission and all these explosions which finally gave way to creation of uh, matter and stars. And finally, all this, once it was done, it was 400,000 years which lapsed, you saw this kind of a remnant radiation coming out to you. This is what you see. Once you go to space, this is the most remarkable discovery of cosmology in the last 100 years. Once, uh, I think it was John Matter, once he presented that black body spectrum, and he showed this was, there was standing ovation. Everybody was standing. And uh, that was the, one of the most remarkable. So this is really the fun of science. So uh, this, <clears throat> this artist, artists are wonderful people, very sensitive like, uh, uh, like uh, other people, like scientists. And I had uh, the way uh, Mr. Arib Hazar, Azhar, once we discussed, and that was really, uh, uh, a really nice uh, experience of a discussion. So this is an artist rendition. What he did was that he took the logarithmic distances. You know, like a log, in order, once you have different scales, like I have my hand, then I have this laptop, this screen, Karachi. If somehow I have to put all these distances on a single piece of paper, how would I do it? I would have a log paper, right? I would plot everything in terms of logs. So that's why you have log linear plots in science. Now even in medicine, I, I see doctors, uh, physicians, once they do PhDs and all that, they have these log linear plots and everything like that. So he made, removed the distances between the galaxies and like this. So, and he could actually chart it. The, so, so he took this heliocentric approach, similar to Copernicus. He was the first person who suggested that like sun was the center of our solar system. I think everybody who did it before that was uh, no more, or they tried to kill them. So that was, uh, one of the things that you talk about in science. So anyway, so this sun you see, and then you see all these uh, planets, and uh, you see finally uh, the Kuiper belt and old clouds. And finally, once you go to another image, here is this beautiful image shows you the space. The first image that I showed you was time. This was in terms of time, the temporal image of the universe. This is the spatial in terms of space. This is how you see. You have the solar system in the center, then you have all these clouds, you have galaxies. This is the arm of the Milky, Milky Way galaxy, the Perseus arm, and then you have Milky Way, and the nearest, our closest neighbor is the Andromeda. The Andromeda galaxy, and then you have, and he took out the billions, billions of light years which are between us and between this, and then you see these large scale structures. This is where I'm trying to bring you to. This is, these structures, they say, are the large scale structures. And they are called, this theory is like filaments, that actually the universe 
the way it is it exists in the form of filaments so this is the filament structure of universe these lines these lines that you see are actually hundreds and hundreds of maybe billions if i'm not wrong light years of distances and these voids are there which exist between them so this is a large scale structure actually we don't exist anywhere how can we be arrogant human beings or earth bound i i don't understand when people are arrogant you're not even you're not even like a dot in this grand scheme of things so this is the grand scheme of things that was the video that i wanted to show you and now this is i am sorry all of you came here to look at the pictures of dark matter or dark energy there is no picture it cannot be like if you look at uh, uh, lectures by people so this is perhaps the best picture of dark matter you can see so here what you see is this is the time when actually big bang started or even more than big bang from where we see the light coming up the cosmic macro background so Finally, you come to the time where the Earth is now, the epoch in which we are now. So you see that these clumps are dark matter. These clumps are dark matter clumps. That's how the dark matter exists here. We see it indirectly. Um, all kudos to this uh, this young professor Richard Massey, who has actually made these uh, these plots. So this is you see. So what do you see? Anybody in the students in the students? What do you actually observe? Believe me, science is not doing calculations. science is not doing calculations you can give calculator to anybody you can teach calculus you can teach algebra you can learn it all of you there's no rocket science in algebra or calculus you can do everything the real thing is to infer results from numbers that's what economists do right that's what they are being paid to do a scientist is who can infer results that's what real physics is unfortunately the way the physics is taught or was taught to us was also you remember integration differentiation you remember okay this is newton's first law second law third law thermodynamics everything okay i forgot thermodynamics that's another important thing which goes in it the time why this arrow of time comes here why it's one directional can't we go back can't we go back to where we came from what prevents us from coming from going back to where we came from entropy who was that okay so that's the second law of thermodynamics as the time progresses disorder increases you're all sitting here peacefully after an hour or two you'll all start feeling uncomfortable and if half of you leave it would leave more spaces and then it's just like children if you leave 10 children in 20 seats they'll be sitting here and here and here so you have more vacancies available so this is what entropy is the amount of disorder in universe or in a closed system and the second law of thermodynamics states that in a closed system entropy would always increase with time so that is the reason you have the arrow of time it comes from entropy it comes from thermodynamics any theory any theory it can violate any law of physics gravitational law of physics einstein's equations schrodinger equation but if it violates laws of thermodynamics it cannot be possible it won't be a physical theory so thermodynamics is the actually the cornerstone on which or the touchstone on which you actually test theories if it i mean somebody here somewhere i do not wish to say it somebody claimed to have made an engine which worked on water how could it work on water for god's sake there could not be any reason for any system to work with water only although nevertheless water itself is a very special molecule is a very special molecule i mean thermodynamics aside but it's a very special molecule so what do you really get from this plot what do you understand we are there so what do you really understand from this plot what this plot says that we are going towards more disorder in the start you see that they are all clumped together now it is sort of diffusing so these are sort of pictures that you get so these are the pictures what hubble saw the images formed from this and this is an actual simulation z equals to 0 means the time of big bang and z equals to all the positive numbers are actually the red shift which is being accumulated in what we see so this is what we see actually from the start till what is going on right now so 
you could find, so this is a couple of things which happened recently. This cluster of galaxies is known as Abel, Abel 2766 or something. So this innocuous flowing structure, once you take a picture with Chandra's X-ray, it's one of the observatories, this is X-ray image. So this image shows you a bit of uniform, not uniform, I mean you see structures, you can still see structures clumped together, but you see a lot of X-ray, a lot of sources of X-rays which are sort of clumped together and then you add the dark matter data to it and you see all this and finally this is the image that you get. So this is what really is, is a complex collision of at least four galactic structures. Four galactic structures collided and the result that comes out, it even defies the dark matter models. So there is something else going on which we really do not have any idea about. This is the latest uh, images and latest work which went on. So this is kind of the stuff. So this is the oddball galaxy. This galaxy has missing dark matter. So even the dark matter is missing. So it has 400 times less dark matter content which should have been there. So these are, uh, this is what really is and then this is what I showed you and then this is actually the matter, the actually matter that you see. So I tried to uh, gather some recent data from this. So one of the great uh, physicists, philosophers of last century, I actually did not have time so while coming on my way here. This is Sir Roger Penrose. Anybody of you, if, have you heard The Emperor's New Mind, the book, Emperor's New Mind, the computer science guys? So he talks about consciousness, about computer science, about computers, making supercomputers, computers which could think. So this is, you can say the competitor, he was the greatest competitor of Stephen Hawking. Hawking and Penrose were two schools of thought. Unfortunately, Hawking died recently. But Sir Penrose, he's a great man. I personally uh, really regard him. You should really uh, read about him, the Plato's conjecture, his uh, work on different theories, especially on entropy and his book, uh, Emperor's New Mind. So he talks, uh, I was listening to one of his lectures, so he talks about eons before Big Bang. What happened actually before Big Bang. So I'll just sum it up. This is interdisciplinary science. I wanted to show some slides of like quantum computers and things like that, what's really going on in the world, and econophysics and like that. I have some core pages. So to sum it up is that if you have any questions, please feel free uh, and we could discuss. So what really happened is that there was a Big Bang, an event happened which created the universe 13.77 billion years ago and that universe started to expand and then there was some static era and then again we are going through an expansion. And like they've suggested that all this is going to go towards a big crunch just what happened in the start. Just like the universe was, I mean, if you try to talk in terms of spirituality or faith, in God's one hand, the universe began and he would take it back in his hand and it would end like that. So unless there's a huge cataclysmic accident that happens, like a doomsday or something. So this is actually, so the dark matter is a very important factor which is, and the dark energy, which play their role in the formation, expansion, and might even play a role in destruction of the universe. Unfortunately, we don't know really much about it, but I hope once we have more experiments, more data accumulated, uh, we would know more about it. I'd like to thank you, first of all, thank you, and I apologize for uh, the delay in starting this talk. I hope uh, you're not tired. And uh, thank you to Mr. Ari Bazar and T2F for uh, inviting me for this talk. And two great people I'd like to acknowledge, uh, Professor Saruddin Sayed, uh, a former professor of, from Karachi University. He's actually one of the last students of Professor Abdus Salam. So he did his doctorate from uh, Imperial College with uh, Professor Abdus Salam. And presently he's in a great place which I really admire because that's the only women university in Karachi at the Jinnah University for Women. So I'm really thankful to Professor Saruddin who actually took out time to come here and also to my long time collaborator and uh, the teacher from my childhood, uh, Professor Zahur Sen Shah for his kindly coming, taking out time. Quantum physics, Marie Curie, all this, he was the person, uh, former chemistry of professor, where it all came from. 
And uh, I'm thankful to both of you for coming here, sir. And uh, thanks to, uh, for my research, the funding agencies, and the CACs, the Jazan University grant, and to all the people whose images I used, I would like to thank them, and uh, the copyright holders for these images. Thank you, Arif, and thank you all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Saab, for a very specialized uh, lecture on dark matter. I hope many of you here tonight uh, are students of physics. Uh, otherwise, I don't know how much of that you were able to follow. There were moments when I was having great difficulty. It was a very, very specialized, detailed talk on dark matter. Uh, let me please uh, once again just say our donation box is over there. It means a lot. Whatever you can give happily, thank you. If there are any questions amongst you, we'll, I'll hand the microphone. Please speak into the mic so that we have it for our uh, audiences who are following us on social media. Yes, uh, Inka. Can you please expand on uh, what the presence of uh, dark matter and dark energy suggests in terms of the fate of the universe? Like, to what extent does it make uh, heat, death, or faster than light expansion of the universe more likely? Well, I really only uh, cosmologist. Uh, cosmologist would be more, I think, qualified because I am a dark matter experimentalist. The dark matter talk was given to actually uh, get people acquainted with uh, the dark matter physics, the basic dark matter physics. And uh, so I really uh, could not say, so what was the question I could not understand? So the fate of the universe in terms of dark matter dynamics? What does it make a possible heat there for a faster than light extension of the universe possible? How much more light does it make? Okay, faster than light means superluminal. Superluminal things cannot exist as per theory of relativity. Okay, so I really have no idea of my head right now. I could read about it and we can discuss it later on. Because uh, first of all, dark matter has been there. It has played a momentous role, and especially the aggregation and integration of these structures. So in the end of the universe, what it really, I, I, I'm sorry, I cannot off answer it off my head right now. Yeah, that's a, uh, one of my question is that I mean, controlled nuclear fission, fission reaction in the nuclear plant that should be continuously monitored for the safety of the nuclear plant. And uh, right now we know that two large nuclear plants are under construction in this densely populated city with the Chinese technology, although they say this is third generation uh, plants. And uh, in a few years back we saw the Chernobyl disaster exactly. and, and the in, Fukuyama, and well. Fukuyama yeah. in Japan. So, what do you think, what is the feasibility of the construction of those large nuclear plants with the Chinese technology? Uh, although the, our governments are always in hurry, not to compare with anything, but to award these contracts. I see, China. okay. That's a really… Fission or fusion? What are you talking about? Whatever in the nuclear plants. That I is see. The okay. Bundle nuclear right. rods that is to the right. One. Right. So, I, I think it would be fusion. So. First of all, it really comes to uh, nuclear engineering. I'm a nuclear physicist, I was trained in nuclear physics, but I'm more accelerator based. I've never been part of a reactor based experiment. I've never worked with reactors. And although I've been trained and I've worked in radiation safety. So I think radiation safety is a very important issue. I, even when I go to any clinic, especially in, in Pakistan or somewhere else, other than US or something, I always ask people working in uh, radiation physics departments or medical that you don't carry your dosimeter badges or things like that. So people are very much, uh, uh, I think they don't observe all the radiation safety uh, procedures. At accelerators, we have very stringent uh, radiation safety. Once we are at accelerator, our dose is monitored, we have to carry a dosimeter, things like that. So as far as the safety is concerned, it really, I think, in my humble opinion, again, I'm not trained in that area. I'm an accelerator-based nuclear physicist. I'm a particle physicist, not really a, a nuclear reactor physicist. A nuclear reactor physicist, like maybe, I don't know, maybe Samar Mubarak, Dr. Samar Mubarak would be more uh, qualified to answer this. But I think it all boils down to the initial design. 
and the quality control. I've, I've seen that quality control is the basic element and the radiation uh, protocols that you have in place. So if they're building reactors, first of all, it, it really is a question how much hazard is there? What scale are you talking about? I mean, if there's an accident, how much, what would be the radius? What would be the radius? What would be the circumference of area affected? First. Second, what kind of design? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So again, I'm not familiar with nuclear uh, reactor engineering. I really cannot say, but again, it depends on quality control, on radiation safety, quality control, the designs, actual designs. I mean, I really am not qualified uh, to to comment on this, on reactor design. I, I don't know what kind of reactors they are designing. I've never actually worked with any reactor. We have just studied fusion, fission, all this as part of our training, but never really worked. See, once you do PhD, you're a very, very specialized kind of a person. The best education that you have is in your bachelors. That's the most important part of your education. I'm sorry, but I hope there'll be some quality control. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I want to appreciate that it was a very uh, extraordinary talk and I enjoyed Thank it a you. lot. Uh, my question is about the Big Bang uh, and uh, keeping in view the uh, law that matter is not annihilated and not created, cannot be created or annihilated. So, uh, how can something be uh, come into existence without uh, pre-existing thing or pre-existing energy or matter? Uh, prior or prior in time or uh, uh, anything else. And uh, I had listened uh, by Dr. Micho Kaku. Micho Kaku, yeah, he's a string yes. theorist. He's one of the most popular public speakers. And also Brian Cox, who was my te uh, teacher, one of my teachers, Jeff Forshaw. Yes, so he, uh, his suggestion was that uh, universe is like a bubble. So it is a part of the uh, infinite ocean of the bubble. And when this bubble is split up or it collides, a big bang occurred. So how do you see uh, such a phenomena, uh, big, uh, the processes of big bang, uh, and, uh, before the big bang, what was there? Exactly, that's a beautiful question, thank you. So I'll just try to, uh, yes, we'll take a uh, question from them. Is your question related to his question? Okay. So that's an excellent question which he has posed. So you know about an old oriental legends, a dragon eating his tail. A dragon eating his tail. You have a circle. Everything, that's the best topology that you have in universe. And actually that's also, if you look at the Eastern philosophy, you have the concept of creation and a doomsday. It was created and will die. And then he will, the God will recreate it. And that would be forever. So how could something go forever? Unless it's in a circle. A circle has no beginning and no end. So my best guess is, that like Michio, uh, Professor Kaku said, that's also the same thing. Bubble is a circle, it's a sphere. So that's a very nice representation to perhaps call it that you have a bubble, a sphere, and then you have another bubble. That's how the multiverse theories are. Uh, you might have heard about Tex, um, Marx Tegmark. Marx Tegmark, he has, yeah, so we've had discussions before. Uh, so Max also talks about multiverses, parallel universes. So that's also from quantum mechanics, string theory, you have multiple existence. So when I was a kid, I thought that it was just a very innocuous thought, but now I really appreciate that when I was in my teen years, I used to think uh, we, are, we are actually living in one. I, I'll, I'll borrow the cursey to speak in Urdu because I might not say it beautifully in English. So, that in the world we are living, which is our existence, like we are sitting, if there is a temporal difference, a one-minute difference, out of phase, and that's what cosmologists talk about, out of phase universe. So, one universe in phase, and one universe out of phase. So, we are with our twin universe, which is one second behind us, or one second behind us. We can't see them, because we are one second behind us, or one second behind us. We can only see them, who is with us at the time. You are with me at the time, so I can see you all. But what has created us from one second, or what has created us from one second before, we can't see them, we can't see them, we can't see them. So, this is like synchronicity. So, so that's a good explanation. Big Bang, because you cannot, that's the first law of thermodynamics. So that's the 
that's what singularity means aisi cheez ke jiska wujood mumkin nahi hai black hole is something that cannot be existed it cannot happen it cannot be see a divide by zero it's undefined you don't have any explanation for infinity infinity kya hoti hai maine bhi socha aap logo ne socha ke bachpan mein ke ye kainat kab se shuru hui thi agar kabhi shuru hui thi jaisa big bang is actually t equals to zero i forgot to mention big bang was t equals to zero waqt ka aagaz that was the start of time before big bang there was no time and after big crunch the qiyamah doomsday again there will be no time so we are in this bubble like which your kaku said and once this bubble breaks and we get into something else which is beyond the bubble there's no time of outside the bubble so that's a very very important and, and pertinent question what happened before big bang and where did this energy come from which actually formed matter dark matter dark energy where this all came from so that's exactly and there are all kinds of hypotheses about it sir just one comment ke aapne wo jo snake ki baat ki hai ke i saw that slide of snake eating its own head right uh, by uh, dr carlos frank i at, see uh, at uh, durham university in uk <coughs> in durham right yeah. acha my question is ke um, we now have james webb coming up uh, i think next year that is uh, being sent in space uh, james webb telescope right no i'm not aware i'm sorry acha you're not aware i'm okay. very ignorant i'm just in my lab going to us to do experiments coming back to my lab and because i thought maybe no, I'm after sorry, I'm hubble uh, we have james webb coming yes, up so the hubble has been there for more experiments time. being yeah. designed there so if you were aware of any experiments yeah. that yeah. we we done exactly. to detect exactly there are um, there was a professor a friend of my advisor we met in malaysia kuala lumpur and he said if you have a like how much dollars he said if you have a million dollars you can send a payload of this big to space so there are all kinds of experiments going on and it's just a, such a shame that we are not sending any experiments in space so i'm sorry sir i'm not familiar with that yes hello sir. Uh, so my question was about axions uh, so you mentioned uh, as far as i understood that axions have a different exchange symmetry compared to fermions so i would understand that they are exchange symmetric but how does that help to explain axions are bosons by the way i'm sorry to mention because it was very specialized okay. they're bosons axions are bosons they're similar to photons okay so axions are bosons yeah. okay so how does that help to explain dark matter so what property of axions is consistent with the peculiarities okay. of dark matter i mentioned matter? about pq uh, pq quen solutions once you have the lagrangian of quantum chromodynamics yeah. once you work with that lagrangian it should violate the cp the qc to lagrangian should violate the charge parity symmetry but it does not violate so the reason for that was that similar to nambo goldstone bosons there are particles which actually after symmetry breaking are created and they are the particles which prevent the symmetry breaking and they are similar to nambo goldstone bosons and the solutions are actually axions okay. so that's just the answer of this okay. i think uh, that's the best i can थैंक यू यस माइक डॉक्टर साहब एक एडिशन मुझे करना था जी प्लीज आई माइट हैव मिस्ड समथिंग 19 अर्ली 1930s में uh, इंडिया से सब्रामणी चंद्रशेखर गया था यूके और वो स्टूडेंट था सर आर्थर एडिंगटन का और ये चंद्रशेखर था जिसने पहली मर्तबा थेरेटिकली कैलकुलेट करके ब्लैक uh, होल्स का आइडिया पेश किया था जिसे सर आर्थर एडिंगटन ने बड़ी हकारत के साथ रिजेक्ट कर दिया था और ये कहा था कि एक इंडियन के पास इतना दिमाग कहाँ से आ गया कि वो थेरी ऑफ रिलेटिविटी में इस तरह से कोई बात कर सके फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आपने जो कि तस्करा श्वास चाइल्ड रेडियस का किया चंद्रशेखर इज अ ग्रेट साइंटिस्ट उस बेचारे का तो पचपन साल नोबल प्राइज से इस चक्कर में रुका रहा आर्थर एडिंगटन के खिलाफ था सेकेंडली मुझे आपसे ये बात पूछनी थी कि हमने डार्क मैटर के सिर्फ इफेक्ट्स देखे हैं वो भी ग्रैंड स्केल पे हमने सोलर सिस्टम के स्केल पर अभी तक इसका कोई इफेक्ट ऑब्जर्व नहीं किया है हमने इसको गैलेक्टिकल स्केल पर अभी तक हम इसके इफेक्ट्स को ऑब्जर्व कर वेरी गुड क्वेश्चन वेरी नाइस तो ट्रू कहीं ऐसा तो नहीं है कि नाइनटीन सेंचुरी के एंड में हम ईथर के बारे में सोच रहे थे कि देर इज समथिंग लाइक ईथर जिसको हम देख नहीं सकते बट वो एग्जिस्ट करती है बाद में मालूम हुआ कि वी डू नॉट नीड टू हैव ईथर टू एक्सप्लेन वेरियस थिंग्स कहीं ऐसा तो नहीं है कि डार्क मैटर जो है वो ट्वेंटी फर्स्ट सेंचुरी का और मॉडर्न फिजिक्स का एक ईथर बन गया हो हमने उस पर बहुत ज्यादा बिलीव कर लिया क्योंकि देखिए मोदी मोती मिलग्रोम का काम मॉडिफाइड मॉडिफाइड न्यूट्रेन डायनामिक्स जो है उसके हक में भी लोग बहुत सारी बातें कर रहे हैं लोग कह रहे हैं कि ये एक ये प्रेडिक्ट करता है 
اس کے مقابلے میں اگر آپ ڈارک میٹر کی ایگزسٹنس کے بارے میں بات کریں تو ڈارک میٹر ایک نظریہ ضرورت کے تحت ہمارے سامنے آیا کہ ہمارے پاس کچھ ڈائنامکس تھیں جن کو ہم ایکسپلین نہیں کر رہے آپ اس بارے میں کیا کہیں گے بالکل میں اس سے بالکل اگری کروں گا انیشلی آئی واز ناٹ ریلی انٹرسٹیڈ ان ڈارک میٹر آئی واز جسٹ ایز آئی واز پریٹی مچ اسکیپٹک اباؤٹ میرا بھی ان تھیوریز کے بارے میں اور تھینک یو فار ٹیلنگ ایس دیٹس ریلی انفارچونیٹ کہ ایڈنگٹن جو تھے انہوں نے اس طرح سے چندر شیکھر کے ساتھ کیا چندر شیکھر واز اے گریٹ سائنٹسٹ اور ایکچولی جہاں تک انڈیا کے لوگوں کو کہنے کا تعلق ہے تو انڈیا میں تو بوز بھی تھے اور بوز کا پیپر آپ کو پتا آئنسٹائن نے بوزون جو کہتے ہیں فوٹ آن از اے بوز آن تو بوز کا پیپر تو خود آئنسٹائن نے کریکٹ کر کے بوز بوزون بوز کے نام سے پبلش کیا اور وہ بوز آئنسٹائن اسٹیٹسٹکس جو فزکس کی ہیں وہ ان کے نام پہ ہیں تو یہ تو خیر بہت ہی ایک جاہلانہ آئی ایم سوری ٹو سے ایک سوچ ہے کہ کوئی انڈیا جی اب اس وقت جو اس وقت تھیورسٹ بیسٹ ہیں دنیا کے ان میں پونے کے پدم ناپن بھی ہیں ایکچولی آئی لائک ٹو میٹ پدم ناپن مے بی یو آر فیملیئر ود از ورک یا ایرک ورلنڈے ہیں ہو از فرام ہو از اے ڈچ فزسٹ سو اب اینی وے کمنگ بیک ٹو دا کوشچن اٹ سیلف تو بالکل ایک نظریہ ضرورت ہی ہے اور جو لگ رہا ہے جہاں تک بات ہے اس کے ٹیرسٹریل یا ایٹ لیسٹ سولر سسٹم میں افیکٹس دیکھنے کی تو ریسنٹلی ایک ایک دو اسٹڈیز ہوئی ہیں جس میں کچھ پارٹیکلس کچھ ایکسائٹیشنس نظر آئی ہیں کنڈنسڈ میٹر فزکس والوں کو چیزیں بناتے ہوئے جو چھوٹی چھوٹی چیزیں بناتے ہیں جیسے گرفین پہ کام کرتے ہیں تو اس میں کچھ انہوں نے سگنیچر ایسے وولٹیجز میجر کیے ہیں ففٹی فائیو ملی وولٹ اور سم تھنگ جو کارسپونڈ کرتے ہیں ہنڈریڈ ٹین مائکرو الیکٹران وولٹ کے ایکزیونس پہ تو اس پہ کیمبرج کے ایک پروفیسر ہیں میرا لیپ ٹاپ کھول کے میں آپ کو پیپر بتا سکتا ہوں تو انہوں نے اس میتھمیٹیشن ہیز اے میتھمیٹیشن کیمبرج کے ہیں انہوں نے اس ورک پہ سجیسٹ کر کے کہا ہے کہ یہ اصل میں ایکزیونس کا سگنل ہے تو اب ایک کولیبریشن اس پہ کام کر رہی ہے جو ان کا مجھے ان کا نام بھول گیا بہت دنوں سے میں چھٹیوں پہ آیا ہوں دیٹس وائی یو نیڈ ٹو بی بزی ٹو ریمین ان بزنس ادر وائز یو آر یو نو یو آر اولڈ سو انہوں نے سجیسٹ کیا ہے تو ان کا ہے ہنڈریڈ ٹن مائکرو الیکٹران وولٹ کے ایکزیون ایگزٹ کر سکتے ہیں جو آپ لیب میں ایکچولی میجر کر سکتے ہیں تو آہستہ آہستہ پھر ایکزیون کا اٹ سیلف اوریجن صرف کاسمالوجی سے تو نہیں آتا دیٹ کمز فرام کیو سی ڈی ایز ویل فرام پارٹیکل فزکس ایز ویل اسٹینڈرڈ ماڈل سے وہ بھی یہ نہیں کہ آپ باہر سے ناٹ بیانڈ اسٹینڈرڈ ماڈل سو کافی کچھ کنوینسنگ ایویڈنس ہے کہ ڈارک میٹر کچھ نہ کچھ ہے کڈ بھی پاسبل کہ ہم جب میجر کریں تو پتہ چلے کوئی اور چیز ہو ویسا ڈارک میٹر نہ ہو بٹ دیر از سم تھنگ کیونکہ اتنا جو ڈسکرپینسی اٹ کین ناٹ بی فار نو ریزن سو کچھ تو ہے لیکن ہو سکتا ہے ویسا نہیں جیسا ہم سمجھ رہے ہیں دیکھیں ایتھر کی جو تھیوری تھی کہ وہ ریجیکٹ ہوئی دیٹ واز سمپل تھیوری کی ایک میڈیم ہے ایتھر کی وجہ سب کو کہ فیکٹس نظر نہیں آ رہے تھے میں نے خود سمجھ لیا یا اس وقت کے فیسلس نے سمجھ لیا آج سے ڈیڑھ سو سال پہلے کہ لائٹ ٹریول نہیں کر سکتی جب تک ایتھر نہیں ہوگا لائٹ ساؤنڈ ویوز کی طرح ہیں لیکن ساؤنڈ ویوز سے لانگ ایٹیوڈ نہ لیں دے آر پریشر ویوز لائک ارتھ کوئک لائک کسی چیز کا بھی پریشر اس میں اور لائٹ میں ٹرانسفرس ویوز میں فرق ہے اور پھر مائیکلسن مارلے نے ایکسپیرمنٹ کیا اور انہوں نے دیکھ لیا کہ جی ایتھر کا کوئی ایگزٹنس نہیں ہے تو دیر از اگین اے پاسبلٹی کہ آل دس گوز ڈاؤن دا ڈرین سو لیٹ سی واٹ ہیپنس بٹ آئی آئی ایم آپٹومسٹک کہ اگلے پانچ چھ سال میں اس سائڈ پہ یا اس سائڈ پہ کسی طرف آ جائیں گے فیصلہ ہو جائے گا اچھا اسپیس میں ہو جائے گا یا زمین پہ ہو جائے گا ہاں جی اللہ کرے پانچ سال تک اگر مائی کوشچن واز ایکچولی کوائٹ ریلیٹڈ ٹو دس اباؤٹ ڈارک میٹر پاسبلی بینگ دا فلاجسٹن اور دا ایتھر آف دس ایئر دس ٹائم ایریا ایرا آف آرز could you just briefly give your opinion on uh, emergent gravity theory or entropic gra- gravity as they're calling it how uh, valid does that seem or up uh, like our publications kind of pumping it up more than it actually is now is it part of a string of uh, it leads on from it it's basically saying that gravity rather than being a fundamental and this is a really rudimentary way that i'm putting it but basically what they're prescribing is that gravity is not a fundamental force that it's emergent similar to say heat Uh, is an right, emergent, emergent, it's emergent theory. Basically, right, right. the emergent theory of gravity. How is there, uh, because for example, they're saying that it works with general relativity and it uh, does away with the need for dark mm-hmm. matter and then it also co- uh, reconciles quantum uh, uh, mechanics with general relativity. Is that true or they just pump, p- certain publications pumping okay. it up to be... So that area, thank you, that's a very pertinent question. Asal mein jab... جب یونیفیکیشن ہوئی جب پروفیسر سلام نے وائن برگ نے گلیشو نے ان لوگوں نے الیکٹرو میگنیٹزم کو ویک تھیوری سے ملا دیا کہ ایک سرٹن انرجی اسکیل تک یہ فورس اصل میں ایک ہی ہے دیٹس دا سیکنڈ یونیفیکیشن پہلی میگزول نے کی الیکٹرو میگنیٹزم کو یونائٹ کیا اور پھر سلام گلیشو وائن برگ ان سب ن
تو پھر اس وقت یہ آیا کہ اب یونیفائی اصل میں یہ ایم ہے کہ جب کائنات بنی تھی وین دا بگ بینگ ہیپن ایوری تھنگ واز جسٹ ون سو وی آر ٹرائنگ ٹو سمپلیفائی کہ ساری فزکس ایک ہی ہے ایک ہی فورس ہے ایک ہی انرجی ہے بٹ دا ڈفیکلٹیز اسکیلس گریوٹیز وے 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 فیبل دا کپلنگ از ویری ویک اینڈ دا اسٹرانگ از ایکسٹریملی اسٹرانگ بٹ اٹ از ڈسٹینس ڈپینڈنٹ اٹس ایکسپوننشیل سو بہت دونوں کے لاز میں فرق ہے گریوٹی انورس اسکوئر لا فالو کرتی ہے اور اسٹرانگ فورس ایکسپوننشیل سو اب ان کا یہ ایم تھا کہ ہم گریوٹی کو کس طرح ملائیں کیونکہ اسٹینڈرڈ ماڈل میں تینوں فورسز آ گئیں گریوٹی آئی ایم سوری ایم سوری ہاؤ لانگ کین وی اسٹے ہیئر گریٹ اینڈ دین اوکے سو لیٹس فین ایز جسٹ دس کوشچن اینڈ ون مور کوشچن اوکے سو دس واز دا ایم وچ آئی ڈڈ ناٹ شو ان دس کہ ہاؤ ڈو وی کنسائل دس از دا بگیسٹ چیلنج ایف یو کین ڈو اٹ آئی ہوپ یو کین ڈو اٹ یو کین گو ایڈ اینڈ گیٹ دا نوبل پرائز اینڈ بیکم این ایم مارٹل اینڈ سائنس سو دا ایم از دس کہ کوانٹم میکینکس تو پرانی ہو گئی ریلیٹیوسٹک کوانٹم میکینکس آئی اس کے بعد کوانٹم فیلڈ تھیوری ہم سب نے پڑھے گیج تھیوریز پڑھی گیج تھیوریز کی وجہ سے یو گاٹ گیج بوزونس تو اب پھر اس کے بعد تھا اسی زمانے میں پولچنسکی کی کتاب تھی برائن گرین ون آف دا پیپل ایڈ وٹن دا گریٹ برائٹ گائے اور وان ملڈسینا یہ لوگ ہیں جو اسٹرنگ تھیوری کے پائنیئرز ہیں پروفیسر ایڈ وٹن ینگ پروفیسر فرام پرنسٹن پرنسٹن میں ایک جگہ ہے آئی اے ایس انسٹیٹیوٹ آف ایڈوانس اسٹڈیز دس از دس از دا لیگیسی آف آئنسٹائن بیکاز ہی ورک دیئر ان از لاسٹ ڈیز سو وہاں پہ ایڈ وٹن وان مالڈسینا ہی از فرام ارجنٹینا ان لوگوں نے بیٹھ کر زبردست قسم کی تھیوریز بنائی ایم تھیوری سارا کچھ مچیو کیکو دیز آر آل اسٹرنگ تھیوریز پولچنسکی برائن گرین دیز آر پیپل کے جن ہو آر دا پائنیئرس پھر اسی کے اوپر ان لوگوں نے بلڈ کیا دین ورلینڈے پدم نبھن یہ لوگ آئے جب میں نے اب آئی ایم ریئلی آؤٹ آف ٹچ ود دس سو دس ایریا آف سائنس از کالڈ کوانٹم گریوٹی گریوٹی کی کوانٹم تھیوری وچ ووڈ سم ہاؤ کنسائل دا ویو میکینکس فارمولزم فیلڈ تھیوری کوانٹم کوانٹم کیا ہے کوانٹم یہی ہے نا انرجی ایک کوانٹم آف انرجی اور کوانٹم آف انرجی یہ لائٹ کیا ہے کوانٹم آف انرجی بیسیکلی دے آر سمپل ہارمونک آسیلیٹرز فار فزکس اسٹوڈنٹس لائٹ کیا ہے لائٹ انفائنائٹ آسیلیٹرز ہیں لائک پینڈولمس جو اسپیس ٹائم میں ہر جگہ پہ ہیں جہاں پہ بھی لائٹ ہے وہاں پہ یہ آسیلیٹرز ہیں یا کوئی بھی آسیلیٹنگ تھنگ رائٹ سو یہ سارے آسیلیٹرز ہیں اینڈ دین یو ہیو دا اسپیس ٹائم سو کوانٹم گریوٹی کی تھیوری یہ کہتی ہے کہ سم ہاؤ یو کین کنسائل ریکنسائل کوانٹم فزکس اور کوانٹم فیلڈ تھیوریز وتھ وتھ گریوٹیشن ود جرنل تھیوری آپ اس قسم کی کویجنس لے آئیں فارمولزم اسی کے لیے انہوں نے کہا اب یہ کام تین ڈائمینشنس چار ڈائمینشنس میں نہیں ہو سکتا یہ مائک تین ڈائمینشنس میں ہے لینتھ ہائٹ ویڈتھ بریڈتھ اینڈ دا فور ڈائمینشنس ٹائم ہم نے ہمیشہ یہ سوچا ہم لوگ چیزوں کو لیتے ہیں چار ڈائمینشن میں تین تو نظر آتی ہیں چوتھی وقت ہے وقت میں ہم پیچھے نہیں جا سکتے اور ایک ہم لائٹ کون بناتے ہیں وی میک اے لائٹ کون نتھنگ کین گو آؤٹ سائڈ دیٹس وائی یو کینٹ میک اے ٹائم مشین یو کینٹ گو بیک یو کین گو ان فیوچر آپ لائٹ کی اسپیڈ سے جائیں پیچھے آپ کو جو ٹوئن ہے وہ بےچارے بوڑھے ہو جائیں گے انتقال ہو جائے گا وہ دنیا سے چلے جائیں گے آپ جب واپس آئیں گے تو چار سو سال گزر چکے ہوں گے ایکچولی دیٹ آلسو گیوز یو اے تھاٹ کہ مہراج کا جو انسیڈنٹس تھا وہ آپ کیسے ایکسپلین کر سکتے ہیں سائنس کے ذریعے تو وہ ریلیٹیوٹی کے ذریعے بھی آپ ایکسپلین نہیں کر سکتے کیونکہ ادر وائز وین ہی ریٹرن دا ارتھ وڈ ہیو فنشڈ قیامت آ چکی ہوتی اتنا وقت ان کو واپس آنے میں لگا سب مر چکے ہوتے سو دیٹ از سم ادر سائنس آر سائنس ہماری سائنس بہت ہی چھوٹے لو لیول پہ ہے جو اصل میں سائنس ہے وہ کچھ اور سائنس ہے جس کو ہم ایکسپلین اپنے ہم لوگ تو تھوڑی سی چیزوں پہ مجھے یہ چیز نظر آئی میں نے چیز میجر کی میں نے رپورٹ کر دی دیٹس آل وی نو سو دے آر ٹرائنگ ٹو میک ان دا کوانڈم تھیوری ایک فارمولزم جس میں الیون ڈائمینشنز آ جاتی ہیں پروفیسر سلام کے آخری دنوں کے لیکچرس آپ ان کی بک پڑھیں آئیڈیلس اینڈ ریالٹیز اٹس اے ونڈرفل بک آئی اسٹارٹیڈ اٹ وین آئی واز این ماسٹر اسٹوڈنٹ تو اس میں دیر آر الیون ڈائمینشنس سو یو ہیو دی اسٹرنگس وچ آر الیون ڈائمینشنل آبجیکٹس اب باقی جو ڈائمینشنز ہیں وہ فولڈیڈ ہیں یہ میرا جاہرانہ قسم کا طریقہ ہے بتانے کا بیکاز میری فیلڈ نہیں ہے سو دس از اے ویری ریڈیمنٹری لائک یو یوز دا ورلڈ اینڈ آئی ریئلی اپریشیٹ یور کوشچن دیٹس ریئلی شوز دا اسپرٹ سو یو ہیو دیز ڈائمینشنس فولڈیڈ ٹوگیدر اور تین ڈائمینشنز نظر آتی ہیں اسپیس کی اور چوتھی ٹائم کی باقی ڈائمینشنز آر فولڈیڈ پروفیسر انسار کڈ یو کائنڈلی ان لائٹن ایس از ہی ہیئر اور ہی لیفٹ آج جا چکے ہیں آئی ایم سوری آئی شوڈ ہیو ریکگنائز ہم بفور تو 
یہ ہمارا سرمایہ ہیں اساسہ ہیں اور بڑی بدنصیبی کی بات ہے کہ ایسے لوگ ہیں اور لوگ جانتے بھی نہیں ہیں کہ یہاں کراچی میں پاکستان میں ڈاکٹر فیاض الدین کو تو پتا ہے وہ بھی سٹوڈنٹ ہے ایسا گریٹ فیزیسٹ اور کراچی میں آج سے دس سال پہلے جب میں یو ایس سے آیا تھا تو ایک کانفرنس ہوئی تھی فیزیکس کی اس کے بعد سے آج تک نہیں ہوئی دیٹ واز اے ونڈرفل کانفرنس تو اس میں آئی میٹ ڈاکٹر فیاض الدین ون آف دا لاسٹ اسٹوڈنٹس آف پروفیسر سلام اے گریٹ فیزیسٹ ان اسلام آباد ان کے بھائی ریاض الدین کا انتقال ہو گیا سو ہیز سو دا ادر پرسن از پروفیسر انصار الدین سید تو دے آر ٹرائنگ ٹو میک دس تھیوری آف ہائر ڈائمینشن دیز آر ہائر ڈائمینشنل تھیوریز کہ جس میں ایکسپلین کر سکیں کہ گریوٹی جو ہے وہ بھی اصل میں کوانٹم فیلڈ ہے اس کے لیے وہ سجیسٹ کرتے ہیں کہ جیسے لائٹ ہم تک پہنچ رہی ہے تھرو فوٹونس تو اگر میں کوئی افیکٹ کرتا ہوں وہ فوٹونس کے تھرو میڈیٹ ہوتا ہے تو گریوٹی جو ہے وہ گریویٹونس کے ذریعے انہوں نے گریویٹونس کی پراپرٹیز بھی بتا دی ہیں لائٹ کے فوٹونس کی اسپن ون ہے اور سوری یا اٹ ہیز اسپن ون گریویٹون کی اسپن ٹو ہے سو دیر آر سم پراپرٹیز سو دیز آر کوانٹم گریوٹی تھیوریز اینڈ دیر آر اگین just theories and there are maybe some new emergent theories and I'm not really because the energy scales are involved you can go up to 12 TV Sun pe hamar pas the center of mass energy collision is 12 TV 12 trillion electron volts jo ke baut badi energy hai but still it's not sufficient to test these ideas you have to maybe go into a black hole or somewhere to or some some new i have predicted it that you need some new kind of extensions to physics some new repertoire koi nayi science ke nayi tools ho kyunki hum to sort of saturated right now so the last question and then we go to cafe oh, hello dr bakari first of all thank you for coming yeah, and enlightening us to think out of outside of our bubble um my question is in reference to one of the pictures you showed us recently there is this galaxy that's been discovered without dark matter Right, it's the NGC 1052D. Exactly, exactly. Yes. Right? Yes, this dark Abel, galaxy. Abel or the other one? Yes. The other one. yes. Um, and my small query was that this galaxy, the clusters in this galaxy are moving at a speed of 23,000 miles per hour. And our galaxy or the galaxies that have dark matter that constitute more than 80% of the mass of the galaxy move three times as faster. So do you think that difference in speed would influence how our galaxy will shape because we are assuming that the dark matter is slowly ending and converting to dark energy. Exactly. Would you think that would influence our, the expansion of the galaxy or would it retain it or what in your opinion would influence? Beautiful it? question. Really wonderful. Uh, are you a physicist? No, I'm a bioengineer. <laughs> You're a bioengineer, Marshall. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you, I mean, anybody can come up with a wonderful question. Like uh, I remember in Balochistan, there was a girl from somewhere in Tharparkar when I volunteered for HEC as my first student in Pakistan. So she remembered of her head the distance from sun to uh, earth and things like that. And in my, uh, one of my classes in Jazan in Saudi Arabia, this guy, this student, he actually had studied theory of relativity and he knew the years. So there is, of course, great talent here. So the thing is, is in the first place, if the dark matter content of this galaxy is different from other galaxies, that would definitely affect the evolution of that galaxy. Now, it depends what stage that galaxy is, and of course, that keeps on affecting our dynamics. Now, if the speeds, you mean the rotational velocities or the... Are you talking about galaxy or the cluster? Right, the clusters are what see the galaxies form these clusters and that the clusters make these superstructures so i'm i really have to need to study that again but if the velocities you mean the rotational velocities or the velocities linear velocities the way they're expanding exactly okay so i think that the variable of dark matter content would definitely go into that because uh, now I don't know, I need to study that paper and see that. I just put that slide to add to the knowledge. Maybe we can discuss it later on, see that. Uh, let's see. Uh, but that's a very good question because I would like to really discuss that and see that what... Uh, because I have lately started to come into the bigger picture of dark matter from the smaller picture of dark matter, which was just building experiments, studying quantum chromodynamics, trying to make a Lagrangian. And I'm trying to come out. And actually, this discussion is very uh, nice because it gave me an option. give me a, an opportunity to study these other things other than my own work. So I will look into it. But I, I'm sure there is, the dark matter content affects the velocity. I'm sure it does. Yes, sir, uh, if you would like to have, you can copy it right now. Or uh, if you have USB, you can take it right now. Or I can give you my email address. And I can e 
Sure. So we'll move to the cafe. Aji, we'll talk about it in cafe. If it's a quick question, I can answer right away. Yes. Batai. Right, exactly. So if dark matter, uh, we see clumps around regular matter in the galaxy, that means kind of interacting, in, I guess, in some way with what we have. Gravitational. It uh, interacts by gravitational force. That's what they say. It interacts with uh, baryonic matter using gravitational force. But this dark matter, uh, like regular matter, evolving over time in complexity, or are there any theories regarding that? Wonderful question. That's a beautiful question. Um, see, nobody can answer that. Perhaps a really cosmologist who has studied this subject uh, for a long time. So what you're trying to say is that is the dark matter evolving? So actually dark energy is evolving. It changes. It changes the space and it changes itself. So maybe somehow dark matter also evolves but as per our models, photon did not evolve in 13.77 billion years. Electrons did not evolve as far as we see. So if dark matter is conventional like baryonic matter, it hadn't evolved ever since it was made. See again, the important thing to remember is dark matter, matter, all are manifestations. The reality is something else. These are just our abstractions. Just like numbers, one, two, three, four, five, or the days, names of the days, these are all abstractions for our own convenience or understanding. So, but again, it's a very good question. It's worth thinking about. That's all I can say. Thank you, it was a wonderful discussion. A lot to take home from here.